we're going to go ahead and get started with our planning commission meeting of February 26, 2020. Thank you. Okay. First item on our agenda is the approval of the minutes for the February 12th, 2020 meeting. Would anyone like to make a motion? I'll make a motion that we approve those minutes. Okay, we've got a motion by Sarah. Second. Second by John. Oh, I forgot to put that one on my nifty little thing. Okay, we'll go down the roll. <laughs> Matt? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Carolyn? Agree. Brenda? Yes. Amy? Yes. John? Yes. Okay. Okay. Next item on the agenda is the report of the chair and vice chair. I have nothing to report. Um, I just want to let the Planning Commission know that I'm going to be giving a lecture on the Salt Lake City er earliest plat and on March, March 19th at the Leonardo and you are all invited and I will send you information about that. Oh, cool. So the earliest plat? Yes. Salt Lake was founded <coughs> based on something called the Plat of Zion. Oh, right. And has a um, long history of, and so I'm going to talk about the history of how it has affected our current planning and development. Oh, cool. Thanks, Brenda. <laughs> okay. Oh, your mic's not on. Hello? There we go. <laughs> okay. Uh, report of the director. Um, I don't know. I don't have much to report on um, other than for some of you may be aware um, through various channels that um, we had a string of vacancies happen at the tail end of last year. We had two people retire and another uh, one of our staff members moved to the to the RDA and another one moved to join the, the private sector um, all within about a two-week period. But I wanted to let you know that we are in I think three weeks we will be fully staffed when our final position starts so you'll see some new faces around um, just wanted to let you know that um, hopefully they'll be on start on field trips and stuff so you can get to meet them and and see them and they can learn about what our Planning Commission does um, but I wanted to bring that up um, also the the next Planning Commission agenda looks relatively light, meaning there's only like three or four items. Um, so we'll hopefully give you a summary of our annual report um, that we do every year that kind of rehashes everything we've done, all the stats, how long commission meetings are, all that fun stuff, um, how we helped achieve city goals. Um, but after that, we have huge agendas. So <laughs> big projects. Um, we have some, some of the some very large projects that are either have been submitted or are imminent to the city. Um, and because we had so many applications in the tail end of last year that will just be ripe for planning commission approval or review, um, just wanted to make sure that you guys have that on, on your radar. Um, we do expect um, one new planning commissioner to be appointed in the next few weeks. We don't know the dates yet. And once that name is publicly announced, we'll be able to let everybody know who that is. Um, but uh, so that'll be beneficial for us. We will still have one vacancy. Um, and that vacancy, the mayor would like to um, try to reach out and try to um, get a commissioner who lives on the on the west side of the city. So we are more um, geographically um, diverse that way. So that's all I have. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. All right. Any questions for Nick? Thank you. Great. Thank you, Nick. Okay. We're going to move on to the public hearing portion of our agenda. Uh, just a reminder, if you would like to speak um, uh, any of the public hearings on any of the agenda items, it's helpful if you complete one of these white cards that are located outside the door. Um, it's not required, but it just helps us run the process. Um, and so we will get started with the first. So if I don't fill out one of the cards, I can still speak? Yes, you don't have to fill out a card. This just helps facilitate the process. Um, and so just to give you uh, a little bit more detail on how we run the public hearings, um, 
we announce each agenda item. We have staff come up and give a presentation. We then have the applicant come up um, and speak to us for 10 minutes. We then open it up for public comments. Um, if uh, there's a member of a community council who's present, we give them five minutes to, to speak. Um, then we open it up for general comments from the public, and each person has two minutes in which to provide their comments. Okay. Let's get started. The first item on the agenda is an ADU at approximately 1712 South 1000 East, case number PLNPCM 2019-00652, and we have Kelsey. Okay, so um, the property owner representative is requesting a conditional use approval to construct a 432-square-foot ADU in the rear yard of the property located at 1712 South, 1000 East. The subject property is located in the R15000 single-family zoning district and just south of the Westminster Park on the west side of 1000 East. Uh, this is a photo of the existing structure and the primary elevation of the ADU. Uh, staff has received several public comments regarding concerns about parking, congestion, and public safety. The applicant has identified that the provided parking will be located on 1000 East, which is permitted per the ADU ordinance. So in summary, staff is recommending that the Planning Commission approve the conditional use as proposed and with the condition outlined in the staff report. Great. Thank you, Kelsey. Welcome. Any questions? I have a couple of questions. One, Kelsey, I think it would have been um, good if in those photos we could have had some showing the alley okay. and showing the existing rear structures. The aerial, they were obscured by the trees. I, I went by. I don't live far from there. Um, and it would have been helpful to have that in the review in the packet. The, ex the detached structures? Mm -hmm. Okay. They oh, are sure. planning on demolishing those. Yeah, I read part that they were planning on demolishing okay. them. I think the reason I think that would have been much more helpful in reading the staff report to have those visuals was because I have a question, um, and you're just going to have to refresh my memory on this. What's, what does the ordinance say regarding the size of the ADU and the lot size? Because I know it's limited by the square footage of the home, mm -hmm. but it's also constructed by the lot size. And... So I wanted to follow up and get that clarification from you. What restricts it based on the lot size is lot coverage, and then the amount of the rear yard that you can cover as yeah, well. Yeah, remind me what that is, that coverage is. So in the R1-5000, it's 40%, and for the rear yard, it's 50% of the rear yard can be covered by a, de well, a detached structure whatever that may be, or the combination of the detached structures. So the <clears throat> proposed ADU does meet the square footage requirement and all the other zoning regulations as far as rear yard coverage and lot coverage. Okay. Thanks. But there's not a, just to clarify, there's not a base lot uh, square footage requirement for an ADU. Okay. Any other questions for Kelsey? Okay. Is the applicant here? Hello all again. <laughs> Please make um, sure to state your name for the record. Andrew Palmer. I'm representing the homeowner in this application. Um, and then I I'm Ian Kaplan. I'm the architect that just was recently onboarded with LiveModal, so you'll be seeing my face pretty frequently now as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel, thank you, Kelsey, for explaining that for us. Um, the project is pretty straightforward, so I'm really here if you have any questions, comments, concerns. Okay, so I want to follow up um, on the public comments that were part of the report. Right. And because there's an alley behind this, that other garage is the house adjacent access is their garage via this alley. So with that lot coverage in mind, can the ADU be in place and allow for a parking spot that is accessible from the alley? Yeah. Um, sorry, I just have the plants. It's the size of the ADU is 32 feet long, and um, with meeting the setback requirements, it pretty much takes up the entire width of the rear yard. So there really isn't a whole lot of access from the alleyway to get on parking. But um, 
from the front yard, yes. It, it looks like if the city will allow it, you could actually parallel a stall behind the unit. That's what I was just going to yeah, follow up and so ask. It, it, from what it looks like, the ADU set 10 feet off the rear property line. We'll, we'll follow up with Kelsey when she comes back at the end for sure. that yeah. question. And Tragic. then I also just want to kind of take a moment, um, because now we've heard several comments through various meetings from the community that they would like more information. And I notice now you're providing at least a drawing with the setbacks in that, but now that you have a new architect who's gonna be here often, I think it would be helpful for us to see better renderings of how that space interacts, because when we're looking at these in a single family residential zone, we're looking at how this is gonna function on the site. Right. And so just those spatial drawings of how many feet and this and that are helpful, but they don't do quite the job. There's yeah, so previous ADU applications you could refer to that give us a much better visual yeah, so to understand are, that. Are you looking for like an aerial that shows the existing house and its relationship to that? Or, Not necessarily I mean, always an aerial, but there's you should you know maybe work with staff to look at some previous applications sure. from other, for other ADUs that are providing better visuals to kind of get an idea of yeah. how this is going to function on every specific site. Sure. Yeah, I, I appreciate the comment and definitely part of my onboarding with Live Modal is to kind of start to help streamline some of those, these processes for both your side and for ours. And Great. so... Um, that seems to be a recurring comment that I yes. see um, from the public. <laughs> yeah, so. and, and I think we'd all like to start to um, cut down the amount of time that we spend on these, right? Because they're about the same every time, different location, but same structure. And so, um, yeah, the comments are greatly appreciated and we'll, we'll start to kind of streamline the submission packet as we move forward with these to make sure that it's taking less of your time to review and helping you guys visually understand what's going on with it, so. That's all I had. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we'll now open the public hearing for this item. I have, um, Cards from Judy and Lynn. Are one of you coming on behalf of the community council? Is that you, Judy? Yep. Okay. I think Amy just covered half my comments. <laughs> Please make sure to state your name. I'm Judy Short, the land use chair for the Sugar House Community Council. Um, this parcel is 0.11 of an acre. Hello? There you go. I'll but on your mics as well. Yours is an idea. We can yeah, yours, yeah, yours are terrible too. Yeah. I think the key is we have to talk closer. Um, this lot is only 4,700 feet, not even 5,000 square feet. I think that's what makes it feel so tight. The driveway along the side of the house is only five feet wide as it goes past the house. So it can't, I don't know what the garage has ever been used for. I can't drive that well. Anyway, I just we think it's too small. Um, we had some comments. It's interesting. My letter said we didn't have any comments, and then I see that I attached several comments. So, no accounting for what I say. Um, I think we want better drawings than than we have. I think for me to be able to see the relationship of the building in the backyard compared to other buildings on other houses nearby really helps to be able to get a feel for the property. Because driving by, it's really hard to see into the back. And we didn't feel like we could just walk up the driveway and take a look. So uh, sort of grudgingly, we, we approve this because it does meet the standard. But I don't think it, I, I think, you know, there's another one in Sugar House. Maybe I'll bring you the pictures when it's finished. We're, we're cramming things onto too small a lot, and I don't think it's, it's making for pleasing living. Okay. Thank you, Judy. Okay, Lynn Schwartz. Please make sure to state your name for the record, and you'll have two minutes. Lynn Schwartz, Sugar House Community Council. This is a very small lot, and the ADU will make it feel very crowded. The distance between the house and the ADU may seem like a good distance, but 30 feet is not that much. Since the garage will be demolished and the driveway is too narrow for parking cars, 
all the cars will be parked on the street. And once again, the stated purpose of the ADU ordinance, which is to provide affordable housing, will not be met as this will be rented as a market rate unit. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else here who would like to speak? Okay. Please come forward, state your name for the record, and you'll have two minutes. But I live at 965. Please, before you start giving your comments, please have a seat. Okay, 965 East Blaine Avenue. And state the your name. House is state your name, please. Joanne Syndergaard. Thank you. I feel it's, it's a big safety hazard to put a, a unit behind the house and have them park in front of the house because when you park at someone at the street, on the street at the park, and they can't park on 17 South on the south side, and the park's sitting here, and then people park here, and they want to put the cars, and the guy has a motorcycle and a car, and I don't know what else, and he, over, the, uh, over time, has rented out rooms, and there's lights in the basement, so he must be still continuing to rent out rooms. I just don't think that on the corner they have a house and they have to back their two cars in or forward but back into the street and they have an apartment in the basement and then you go a little house and then you have a duplex three of the kids used to skateboard on the on Blaine Avenue because the street's too busy and the next house has a family and the a husband and wife and two teenagers and so you go down the street there's just no parking and there's in the cars and the kids come to the park and getting across 17 South is just takes your life in your hands. And so I don't think they should be allowed to put more cars on the street because there's already too many cars on the street and it becomes just a hazard because I walk all the time and crossing 17 is just a pain. And with, he already has a basement with the rentals that he does. And now he's gonna put this in the backyard and take up more parking in front of, a, 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 of 10th East. So I'm sorry, that's how I feel. So okay. thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Okay, please come forward. Make sure to state your name for the record. Hello, uh, my name is Jackson Worley. Uh, I'm an architecture student up at the U. And when I was reading over these, <clears throat> excuse me, when I was reading over these um, proposals for both ADUs on the agenda, um, I noticed their um, proximity and uh, placement on the site in, in respect to where public transport is. And I think it's maybe not unfair, but um, maybe a pre-consideration to think that someone who may rent these ADUs or inhabit these ADUs um, won't have a vehicle. And that in that Sugar House area, I personally live there too, I'm about two blocks up. Um, not everyone there has a vehicle. And I believe that in the ordinance where it says that um, ADUs are designed to limit impacts and protect neighborhood character, I believe that the placement of the ADU uh, to the left of the driveway minimizes its impact and the bus line one line up on um, 1100 South is viable for a tenant who may not have a vehicle. So I believe the vehicle concern um, may be a little bit um, of a predisposition towards an individual who may rent it to have a vehicle. And I believe it should be approved. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Zach. Hi, uh, Zachary Dussel. Well, that's a first having backup on this, but uh, <laughs> I'd also like to present an additional layer of um, additional transportation options for this site besides the assumption that we have at these meetings that whoever is gonna own this or rent this unit has a car, they're gonna drive it everywhere, they're gonna ruin the neighborhood with their extra car. Um, this site is 20 minutes biking to downtown 20 minutes biking to the U, 10 minutes biking to the Sugar House Business District. I think that's a pretty reasonable distance for a bike commute. I think it's quite possible that you could live here without owning a car. Um, I think the 
ADU meets the standard and it increases housing and overall housing stock, more housing stock will increase affordability. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak on this item? Okay, seeing none, we will close the public hearing. We'll bring Kelsey back up. So Kelsey, can you address the comment about whether you can have a parallel parking space off an alley? <clears throat> there is potential room to have a parking space off of the alley if they move the ADU towards the east. Um, our standard parking width would be a nine by 18 and the lot is approximately 40 feet wide. So I, I think there could be room to have a parking stall back there. And there's no reason by law why they couldn't do that? No, our only restriction for backing out onto an alley is for multifamily use and this is still a single family use. Uh, Nick, correct me if I'm wrong, but no, okay. Thank you. I have another question for you. Uh, one of the uh, witnesses seemed to suggest that, they, that the owner of this project also had a, was renting out his basement. Is that correct? There's no indication of that in any of our city records. Um, so there's no unit recognized. It's possible that he's renting out a room, but uh, that was the first time I have heard of that as well. Okay. So, so is that something that you would investigate as a, could, could investigate as a condition of this approval? Or is that an enforcement issue? It's an enforcement, an enforcement issue. issue. So if somebody has a basement apartment and they're proposing an ADU, they would, they would by default not be able to do the ADU because they wouldn't be authorized by the code to do it. So it's very challenging to prove that there actually is a basement apartment in some place. Um, it's perfectly within a property owner and a homeowner's right to rent out portions of their property. Um, by city ordinance, you can have up to three unrelated people living in your dwelling. How you do that is, up, is really up to you, provided you're not creating completely separate units. Thank you. Okay. We have questions for the applicant. Do we want to discuss the possibility of recommending moving the ADU unit forward to provide an off-street parking spot off the alley? Um, yeah, I would, uh, well, I guess the question for the applicant is if you are willing, where'd they go? Oh, they're there. Here. Yeah. If you um, are willing and if the, the homeowner is amenable to that modification to move the ADU slightly to the east to allow for a parallel parking. Um, it's, yeah, definitely discussion I can have with him. Absolutely. I don't see any issue with that. Um, I don't know how he'll feel about moving it closer to his home for the sake of privacy, um, but I definitely think I could discuss that with him and bring it to his attention because I definitely think we could have a, a parking stall back there. It makes sense too. You know, excuse me, Chris Strant with Live Model as well. Um, you know, one thing I think is that we've followed all the ordinances. We can certainly approach the homeowner and see if that's something that he's interested in doing or something like that. But again, I believe we followed everything. Yes, you do. I think the conditional use standard though is us identifying detrimental impacts through the report, through public comments, and if a majority of those comments are solely focused on parking, then it is our job as a planning commission to investigate ways to mitigate that detrimental impact, and in this way we're talking about providing an off-street parking to do that. So the legal standard for those conditional uses is that these are the discussions we should be having. Oh, I, I understand, so, Commissioner Berry. So I'm, I'm reticent to advocate for creating that as a condition because the homeowner's not here, but I would strongly encourage that because that is the negative impact that's been identified in this conditional use application and there is a way to mitigate it um, that takes that away by providing that off-street parking via the alley, yeah, which is why so I'm also, one of the reasons why I really always 
generally oppose alley vacations is because we want to be using them for these type of things. Absolutely. So um, I would, I mean, I would be happy to strongly encourage that you do that, and in the future, you know, for very urban sites like this, you look into those a little bit harder. Yeah, absolutely, totally agree. Um, do you know how much we would have to move it to make room for that parking spot? Because if it is nine by eight, we have ten. It's a ten foot setback already. Yeah, it should yeah. probably so we be need okay. To move so it necessarily. It's, yeah. So a, a parallel stall by our code has a minimum width of eight feet three inches, and then a minimum length of I think seventeen six or something like that. Maybe. So oh. they wouldn't really have to move it. Yeah. So they would not have to move it. Mm -mm. They can park within the park rear yard within setback. That setback? In the rear yard, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that seems yeah. like then you yeah. should do that, and then we don't <laughs> we don't know how to talk about it anymore because you've mitigated that detrimental impact to the neighborhood Absolutely. that has been identified yeah. as parking, and they've got it, and you don't have to move the ADU. And um, I just for other projects, I want to clarify: there's been an, a lot of you know doing the on-street parking. Um, because there's been some back and forth with zoning about what was required for tandem parking in a driveway. Um, and we've come to find out now that it is specifically allowed for ADUs. Um, so that is something that we can also start showing on our site plans um, as parking on site for the Yeah, ADU tandem occupant. parking is allowed. And I do think that there are some neighborhoods like this. The next yep. one doesn't quite hit this mark. Right. Where you do have... I mean, there is off-street parking available. I live right near there. I know there's off-street parking available, but um, when you know the neighbors get more concerned about that, that's this type of a neighborhood where you do have a lot of uses, and then with the park, and you have a lot of traffic, foot, and um, cars. Pay attention to that more. There are some neighborhoods in Salt Lake City where it's not as much of an issue because yeah, the next one really has no yeah. um, street parking issues. So I also have one more comment to to, the, to you guys, which is um, pursuant to Amy's comments earlier about the site plan, I think what we really need to see is the surrounding properties as mm -hmm. well as the property. So yeah. we need to see what is the, the buildings and the arrangement. So here, there's really no indication of the alley, the park, the house next door, things like that. So that's something that, yeah, we, absolutely. that would be very helpful for us to have. Absolutely. Not um, that hard to do. Moving forward, now that we have brought on this architect, we have new plan sets that do show neighboring properties, show alleyways, so that you can see that vicinity of where Thank the you. ADA will be. All right. Thank you. Any other comments, questions for the applicant or Kelsey? Okay. Anyone willing to make a motion? I'd like to make a motion. Thank you, Brenda. Um, <clears throat> based on the information in the staff report, the information presented, and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission approve petition PLN PCM 2019-00652 with the following conditions. One, the applicant shall comply with the registration process outlined in section 221A.40.200.F of the Salt Lake City Zoning Ordinance. Motion by Brenda. I'll second that. <coughs> second by Sarah. We'll start with John. Uh, yes. Amy? Yes. Brenda? Yes. Carolyn? Agree. Sarah? Yes. Matt? Yes. Okay, motion passes. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, our next item, item number two, conditional use for an ADU at approximately 1039 West Briarcliff, PLN PCM 2019-00992. And we have Eric. Yep. Good evening, members of the commission. Um, yep, you have before you uh, another uh, conditional use for an ADU, um, similar or same design as was just shown. Uh, 432 square feet at 1039 West Briarcliff and um, proposed let's see here we go so showing the vicinity it's in a on a uh, this large lot in the R17000 zone and it's been found to meet all uh, the requirements of the zoning ordinance and general plan as outlined in your staff report and if you have any questions I'd be happy to answer them 
Okay, any questions for Eric? Yes, I, I have a question, which is um, apparently there's no driveway or any way to get back there, no, uh, no sidewalk, no nothing, so on the site plan. Uh, yeah, so the driveway is located to the side of the house here. Right. So yeah, so it, and then this is a, an existing detached carport and um, they would be able to park tandem there. The ADU itself, right, they would just walk across the lawn or they could put in a sidewalk later or something or other, but there's not a, a hard surface proposed directly to it at this point. Thank you. Any other questions for Eric? Okay. Is the applicant here? Is it our same applicant? Well, I should ask. Any questions for the applicant? Hello again, Andrea Palmer, Moda Living. Um, I, I can address that, the, the access to the ADU. Um, there isn't, like you said, a hard surface, but um, there's gate access right on this area of the property. Um, and that is where he planned on having access for the ADU occupant, um, as far as I'm concerned from the homeowner at this point. But any other questions? Yeah, so he's parking over in the parking stall and then walking around the house to get to that fence? We have the parking on street up here. Oh. Okay. Street, sorry. Thanks. Any other questions for, or do we have other comments from the applicant? There's no plan for a walkway or anything to the ADU? He's had some landscaping plans on, I think he kind of want because his property is so big, he wants to kind of like a gated off rear yard area, but he's kind of been going back and forth and so, and didn't have the time to reflect those landscaping plans on the site plan. Um, but definitely we can make it known to him that it's best to have a walkway of some sort. But I know he did want to enclose the area off a little bit to provide pri privacy for the primary dwelling. Was he putting a fence like through his yard then? So yeah. they're like two separate yards? Yeah, almost. I mean, there would be like an opening. It wouldn't necessarily be like a closed gate. There'd be an opening to get into the area, but not well, completely like the, the only reason to really, I mean, I don't have to bring my landscape plans to the planning commission either, but I think the reason that we're interested in this is because we want to know um, wh how the how the person who lives here is going to park and how they're going to approach it. If they're not, if they're, if as as a, as we were saying, if they're park, if they're expected to park tandem in the existing garage, then they're not going to walk all the way around the house, right? Yeah. So that's clearly just a fantasy or some kind of thing you put there. So, um, so, so that's why we're interested in knowing what the intention of the homeowner is about the approach to this unit. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to jump in here real quick. Um, <clears throat> so on the future site plans that we've been putting together, we have been showing a hardscape surface leading from the existing house to the ADU. But at this stage, most of the homeowners don't really know what their landscaping plans are. Um, so from our end, what we are showing is that, yes, you have to provide a hard surface path to get from the existing home or from the street to the ADU, depending on how you're going to rent it. And that's kind of another big point is a lot of these aren't actually being rented as an additional unit to a of renter, right, necessarily, but some might be actually for mom and dad who are aging but want their own space, um, you know, extra guest space. So th there is a variance in terms of what these uses are actually going to be in the ADUs versus just being like a rental for a student or something like that, right? So I think it's something to consider on these future sites. I understand that. Forward. I'm just thinking of the public interest yeah, in this, of not, not how these people use their backyard. Yeah. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay, we'll ask you to step back oh, and thanks. now open the public hearing for this item. <laughs> please come forward. Doing? Please come forward, state your name into My the name microphone. Jones. Please I wait till you're it. seated so we have it for the record. Thank okay, you, sir. I really don't need this. Well, um, yes, they do to record it. Oh, oh I'm sorry, because I'm loud enough. Anyway, <laughs> I live at 1041 Briarcliff Avenue. I live next door to that house on the west side. 
I've been in that home, me and my wife, since 2004. When we purchased the house, these neighbors here gave us a block party when we moved in. From day one, when Ella Dennis and his wife, his mother lived there, when they sold the house, they sold it to them, the thing that they came out and said to me, to my face, is that we're going to rent this out to LDS students from the LDS college. I yet got to see one, okay? I had the police in my yard. I gave them the okay. They've been in my neighbor's yard looking for people that they rent to. Right now, as we speak, they're renting rooms right now. Okay, so it's been like that all the time since the day that they bought the house. My nephew came to visit me six years ago. And there's five black girls in the yard, in the driveway, fighting. He called me. I work for Danville Development. I work for Hood Housing. Okay, 16 years. I come home. It was a group of girls out there, scratched up this, that, and the other, and I told them to stop. and made them stop. They went in when my wife came home. I told her, she went next door and talked to the people that lived in the house, the two young ladies that lived in the house. We do not do this here. I'm too old. We don't do this. Then, I ended up having another fight when we go to visit my children in Washington State. My neighbor came and tell me that the lady scratched the boyfriend up and he's on my porch and they take her to jail. I didn't have the police show me pictures. Salt Lake Police Department. And I told him, anytime you need to go in my yard, you go into it in regards to this house. Because they rent out rooms. I'm on my back porch one time at 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning because I don't sleep good. I'm old. I don't sleep good. Thank you, sir. Okay, no, but let me explain, ma'am. I wake up. My car door closed. I hear car door closed. I go out and look. My light on my Ford Focus because it slowly goes off. We understand. Dollar stand there is in my back behind my car. Okay. My car's unlocked. Thank you. So we have nowhere to park. Thank you. There's no parking. So you want to put this on us? Thank you for your comments. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Oh. Ma'am, would you like to come forward? Please state your name for the record, and you'll have two minutes. Thank you. My name is Suzanne O'Connor. I live at 1047 Briarcliff Avenue. My husband and I have been there 33 years, and I grew up in the home, so I've actually lived there 60 years out of the whole time. I've known every neighbor that's ever lived there. The people that own this home, and I don't know, I don't see them here, though I've never met them, they sub-rent to the two women who want to put in this tiny house. They, in turn, rent rooms in their basement by the month. So there's any number of people from two cars to four cars added to the traffic on our street besides the two cars of the two women that live there I guess on a permanent basis. The man whose home, name is on the home, Eric Choi, has never lived there. He's always rented it. I've got pictures here of the first snowfall, how there's no parking. We can't get a garbage truck, let alone a snowplow. It can't get past my driveway, my neighbor, Mr. Jones, or my neighbor Elaine Wyckoff's house to plow the street because it sits in a corner where there's about this much space 
before Elaine's driveway and Mr. Jones's driveway. And they park there and they put their cans there. There is no access. The access they're saying they want to use is going to infringe on Elaine Wyckoff's driveway. They don't have one. And they've got a root beer shack that's on wheels parked in their driveway now next to Eddie Jones's house to where his car barely fits in his own driveway. This is unacceptable and we're tired of renters. Thank you. Sir? My name is John Napier. Please, please state your name into the microphone so we have it for the recording. Thank you. My name is John Napier. I live a couple houses down the street. And as you can see on that top drawing, represents the two streets that come together on a 90 degree angle, which makes it somewhat of a blind corner when cars are parked so close to the intersection. So when you come down that street, both streets are so narrow, if cars are parked on both sides of the road, only one vehicle can use the street, the center of the road, which is almost caused vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to bicycle accidents due, due to not being able to see clearly what is coming around the corner. Can I walk over there? No. Just picture cars parked all on that corner and a kid coming on a bicycle or a car you can't see around that corner with the cars there. At times, a vehicle has been parked right on the northwest radius of that corner, sitting right here. A vehicle without a license plate was left on the street when the snow needed to be plowed and it had to be towed away by the city. Allowing more vehicles to park on the street would only make more of a hazard. Garbage pickup is affected. The garbage guys have talked to me and asked why do they park like that. I don't know. Snow removal is affected with cars parked on the street at that corner. My wife was almost hit on that corner. I'm a retired city employee, 37 years with the engineering division. I know what a street looks like. Thank you. Zach? Zach? Zach Dussault, speaking in favor of this petition. Uh, the main reason I'm in favor of this petition is because um, Rose Park doesn't really have a lot of transportation options besides the car currently, and unfortunately that's due to their low density. I believe that the more density that's brought to Rose Park, the better it can be served by transit, the better it can be served by bike lanes. Um, I believe the last um, city council meeting, a bond was approved for raised bike lanes on 600 North. Um, so hopefully that'll become a, a better bicycle corridor, but um, unfortunately there are people in Rose Park who have to rely on the poor public transit that Rose Park has. I believe they only have two bus routes, one's clockwise, one's counterclockwise, and they just have to rely on that because that's their economic situation. And um, I think that more housing in Rose Park would um, make it a more desirable place to live, make it a better um, quality of life. And I also just wanted to address what Amy said in the last ADU application. Uh, your guys' job as commissioners isn't really just to listen to complaints of neighbors. Your job is to decide, is this good for the city or not? And the city as a whole needs more housing. We need to rely on cars less. And I, I just think, remember when you make your decision, take a holistic view of it. It's not just the neighbors that complain, it's everyone else that frankly doesn't show up to these meetings. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, ma'am. Uh, 
Elaine Wyckoff, I live at 1033 Briarcliff Avenue next door to the house in question. Um, I believe in the hearing for the previous dwelling it was mentioned that um, if they rent rooms then an ADU is not permissible. They do rent rooms and have consistently. Um, the driveway that they, they showed a picture that there could be, there is room for a driveway on the east-ish side of the house. There is only one driveway entrance there and that's my driveway. There is not room for another driveway entrance off the street. Um, <clears throat> the, the density problem, yes, um, but the public transportation and, and bike lanes they're talking about are on the perimeter of the neighborhood, not on the neighborhood streets. The neighborhood streets are narrow. Barely can two cars pass if there's nobody parked and there's parking on both sides of the streets all over the neighborhood. So those, those amenities that could be improved are not pertaining to the neighborhood itself where we live and drive every day. Um, and the last thing is the, the little space between Eddie's driveway and their driveway, which is a double driveway, and then my driveway. That space is not big enough for a car, but there always is a car there, and so they hang over our driveway as it is. So we have a hard time bike backing out of our driveway without running the risk of hitting their car. I mean, it's, always, it's a constant concern because that space is too narrow as it is. Those are my concerns. Thank you. <clears throat> Sir, please come forward. Uh, my name is Hakan Asbolu. I'm a architecture student at the U. Um, Going back to the whole density issue, I think density is a healthy way to evolve a city, and Salt Lake City especially is growing year by year, and cases like this only help um, teach us how to adapt, uh, you know, a growing city like Salt Lake City is. And going back to the issue about that tight corner and not being able to see, um, you know, if a car is coming or not, or if a child is coming or not, um, more, you know, compact roads make for more cautious driving. And so likely people driving, it's kind of a traffic slowdown. And so people driving down that road will probably slow down and actually be more cautious and it might actually make a safer um, road in the end, I think. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak? Okay, seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Um, why don't we bring Eric back for a couple questions? Eric, can you please clarify the owner occupancy requirements under the sure. ADU ordinance? Yeah, so that was a question um, fairly early on with this, just due to the comments from the neighbors and looking into it a little further. It's not something we would normally check or verify too extensively at this point, but um, we did get a letter back uh, stating that the homeowner on record, that it's his sister that he rents to, and when you go through our ordinance and look at that, that qualifies as owner occupancy. That meets our definitions. And so um, with that, you know, and then it, as was mentioned on the previous one, um, <coughs> our department at this stage doesn't have a good way to verify other rooms that are necessarily being rented out. There can be up to three unrelated living together. But that's um, not a, a, a bar against having an ADU if you rent out other rooms in your house in addition no, to having yeah not with the th yeah. the three the three just it still qualifies as single family there's no so just to clarify so i could live there in my house rent out two bedrooms and put an adu yes if, if okay. you were single yes. rent out two rooms you could still have an adu rent out two rooms, still, we share a kitchen yeah that still area, counts that as uh, then... that's the same as any other that's the de meets the definition of a family as, as any other single family would and uh, then you can still have an ADU. So um, the indications we have is that that's how this is being done. That would be verified further down the process. They have to certify that. You know, there's a little bit more to it as they uh, get a little further down the line. But yeah, the indications are at this point, and based on the documentation we have, 
that it does in fact meet the requirements uh, as a owner occupied structure and for an ADU. And then on the, they're, they're providing an on street parking spot. Yeah. Which is so permitted under the ordinance, and I'm assuming transportation looked at that spot and there were not issues raised during that review. Right. So, the, um, two things. So, um, there was two different versions of this. The, the early version actually showed a, a parking stall uh, located behind the home here, mm -hmm. and there would be space to do it. There's, there's a carport, there's a, kind of a garage, and then a, a carport here. Those would count as the two required stalls for um, the home, mm -hmm. and then they could, by ordinance, park tandem in the driveway. That would be allowed. Um, however, when they submitted the revised plans, then they started showing the parking uh, parking stall out here, which again would be allowed by ordinance. There's an off-street parking. All right. Can you actually point out on that area, like, where the actual ADU is and where that parking on street parking spot is in relation to ship to property lines? Yeah, so the ADU is back here. It's a large property uh, in the corner here. And so the main home is here. Sorry, this doesn't draw very well. The main home is here. The, oops. The ADU is set back considerably on property. Well, it's showing up really different uh, back here. And then the proposed parking stall in this iteration right. is shown right here, which is on, you know, as the road bends around. That's and the, the where, where's, yeah, my question is, where is that Thank side you, property line in relationship to that parking stall? Um, I'm sorry, the mouse is showing. So yeah, so the property lines here go straight across. So, so. For, for that, on the by ordinance, for that stall to count for the parking, it has to be in front of the subject property okay. wholly, so that, that wouldn't yeah. meet the code. Okay, so, but they could provide, uh, they could park tandem on the site. That, that would still be allowed, so. And that's how the, uh, the original submittal was. So, by my reckoning, it looks like that parking space is in front of somebody's driveway. Is that correct? Because that's, the, that's what the aerial photography shows, which is pretty accurate most of the time. If you zoom in on that aerial, you can see, again, this is a problem of not having accurate plans site, or site plans that show enough information for us to make an appropriate decision. Yeah. And, in, and in the, sta no, and in the, the staff report, it, no, I'm and sorry, in the staff the report, it talks about that you know, despite the fact that they s submitted those plans, they can provide it tandem in the in the driveway, okay. and so that's that's what the uh, indication in the analysis is in the staff report. So this is might be a question for the applicant, but maybe you can answer it. I don't I don't know if it would be under for you, but they were showing us where there's a side entrance in the fence. But that appears to be on the neighbor's property as well. Do you know? So they they have to go the ADU. That's the fence. It's on this side. Fire department access. I mean, that's, that's what I can't tell. The pipeline I have does not show a fence, so I'm I'm not entirely There's, sure what you're okay. referring to. All right. Yeah, well, it, the it's set well within the property, and any other fences or landscape changes that happened would Okay, they said come there was a gate that provided entrance and does the gate not sit on the property line? Um, if they were to provide a fence over here it'd be well with on, within the property line. It, you know, anywhere along here cuz property lines way over on this edge. So okay. So on the other property line? Eight, I think it's like 18 feet from the property line the home is. So on uh, Okay, so on the other property line, uh, on the other side, uh, that property line is running through a driveway, is that correct? I'm gonna keep switching. So that, is, that driveway is shared by the neighbor? No, I don't believe so. It, do we know how accurate? Yeah, so if, unfortunately we can't pull it up on there, but if you look at that driveway and street view, it is a shared it appears to be a shared driveway. No, 
My driveway is shared. Right. That's what I'm talking about. Yours is not. Right. We're talking about. about yep. That's the one we're talking about. Okay. This one here. Yeah, I'm, I've zoomed in. Okay. Yeah. So that. there's a portion of, that would be shared. Yeah. Here. The one up on top, that, where that blue thing is up there, is where their gate is. Right. You have to. I'm going to ask so we not have any more comments from, from the audience during um, our discussion with Eric. Thank you very much. Yeah, so the, the driveway is full width, and then there's, but it has a shared access from the street, the driveway to the west, which is the driveway for the home. Do we actually have a survey, or is this just a guess from Google? Yeah, we do, in the, in, it's on the plans. Okay. Yeah, it shows it, and it shows property lines. But are, how do we know if those are accurate if they're just traced from Google? Uh, yeah, all plans. I mean, we, we do our best to view that they're accurate based on aerials we have. And exact, you know, we can't always get down to exact measurements, but we can get pretty close. If we have better than just Google. Any other questions for Eric or the applicant? Sure. Um, so I think this is a follow up from some of the comments I made earlier that I will clarify. You know, what's before us is a conditional use. And in that standard, we are tasked with identifying detrimental impacts. Public comments is one way in which we do that because that is what we're looking at when we're um, contemplating these conditional uses. I think that we could have stood a lot better uh, documentation for photography of where all these lines happen. So in the future, maybe we can get some better photos in the staff report or at least more comprehensive ones, just more of them. Um, so I'm wondering if we can, to mitigate this impact that we've heard about, I mean, we can't do anything about who they rent to. We can't do anything about that. As long as they meet the ordinance of that it is a family member and that qualifies as family. Um, if we can condition that the parking be tandem to um, the, the motion. I mean, the parking on the plan is not... Compliant. Does not meet, is not right, compliant. it's not going to be compliance. So, so I don't know that if it's in. necessary to. to condition it or if it would also just be a, a helpful layer. It, it to probably this wouldn't matter because just looking at that dimension of how much street frontage they have, they I don't think that they there. could legally park a car there. And that's the standard is that for that on street stall to start to, to, to basically be available it has to be a legally located on-street parking spot, which means driveway spacing, you gotta get your tires within, all of those things, 12 right. inches of the curve, and with the curve, that's, right. so right. I just right. don't think it's going to meet that code. If it does, then then legally they, I mean, they have that, the code allows that. Um, when it comes to the detrimental impact, the standard about regarding parking talks about the location and dimensions, and so, you, if you do find that there is a detrimental impact from a proposed um, location of the parking, the commission does have the authority to to try to move that around to to address that impact. And so, what you're clarifying is that because there is no legal place for them to do that on street, it's it, redundant to do a condition to that because it wouldn't qualify under the standard of the parking for the impact. Correct. If okay. if they don't have a legal spot. But that, but that doesn't mean that you don't, that the commission, because then it, it shifts it on site, um, or if they're within a quarter mile, I think a quarter mile of transit, I have, don't know that this is, but um, then they would have to figure out a legally located spot on their property to provide that parking. And, yeah, and we, we should ask for revisions to the site plan that remove that site, remove that parking spot. Yeah. So it's clear even in this body that and, and yeah. that, that would be a, a good condition, so there's no confusion as right. to uh, whether the site plan itself is approved or just the use, so. Right. Um, another question, a question I had, so this property is unique in the fact that it's really large, 
um, and one of the one of the uh, kind of different conditions is this thing about the site is designed to enable access and circulation for pedestrians and bicycles. And it, it seems, especially looking at these pictures that have been submitted by the public and they're without any sort of pathway for whether you're coming in off the main street or coming off the driveway. Like, I don't know, it, it seems weird that you would say that this is enabled access to pedestrians with no way for which a pedestrian would walk or just cut across grass. And so I'm wondering if that condition is reasonable or not for us to try to say there needs to be a walkway defined to the place, or am I reading too much into what is enabling access for pedestrian and that's not a reasonable condition for us so to, the, so, to require? So the commission, you get to decide that, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if you think that a walkway is necessary to meet that standard, then absolutely you can put it, and there's not one shown, you can put a condition on that that be provided. Um, Generally, what I, some advice that I would give if that's the approach you want to take is to, um, at, at the very least, say what kind of minimum dimension you want, whether, and some basic details, whether it has to be, you know, a solid surface all the way across that width, um, things like that, so that if somebody doesn't come in and just, you know, throw down some flagstone pavers in, in the winter, it doesn't do them any good. We'll get the flagstone pavers, but um, as long as there's just some designation for how you, ex I mean, it's just not just sitting in the middle of a lawn. I mean, right now it's a building in the middle of a lawn. I don't, I mean, I'm sure the architects will have a more insight into what you should <laughs> designate as a walkway. Uh, <laughs> but those are my questions. Thanks, Matt. All right, any additional discussion? I'm sorry, we've closed the public hearing. Thank you. All right, is anyone willing to entertain a motion? Or do we need to discuss potential conditions of approval? Do we want to vet something before making a motion? I mean, I, I'll make a couple comments in a motion unless someone else wants to. So uh, one for staff, and I know this is on, it, it seems like consistently we've had these come forward where there's a question of whether the owner is occupying. And I know it's an enforcement, and that's always the thing that we refer to as enforcement, but it seems like we're approving the construction, the building, and it, it seems like we as a city need to get a handle on that enforcement side, because I, I think as more of these are coming, more being built, we don't have, and if we can't enforce it, and we're improving it, he, we're approving these based on we think what's going to happen, and then we can't enforce it. It's actually the owner that's occupying, or just building more of these, and that's a real problem, I think, for the ordinance in general. And so we should probably try to deal with that as a city. I don't know how we pass that up to the powers that be, we, but um, <laughs> yep, we recognize that. Um, um, I'm so. sure you have to. So that, that's my one comment. The second thing for the public, just we look at these, these are conditional uses, and so we have to define if, if there's ways we can mitigate the impacts, that's the best we can do. We, can't, we, we by, by state law, have to move them through. And so based on, um, so I'll make a quick motion here. Uh, okay, so based on the information in the staff report, the information presented, and the input received in the public hearing, move the Planning Commission approve PLN PCM 2019-00992. Uh, conditional use uh, permit for Briarcliff ADU uh, with the conditions in the staff report and also the additional conditions that the uh, parking, off street parking stall that's proposed in the site plan be removed uh, and, conf and moved to a location that is compliant with the parking ordinance uh, with final approval um, to be approved by staff and the condition that a uh, clearly defined walkway and access route for the ADU be plotted on the site plan for the primary uh, means of access to this ADU with again approval being just designated to staff. All right, motion by Matt. I'll second. Second by Brenda. Let's start with Matt. Yes. Sarah. Yes. Carolyn. Yeah. Brenda. Yes. Amy? Yes. John? Yes. Okay, motion passes. Thank you all for attending.
Yeah. Okay. Thing. Next so, item. Um, if anybody, there are a couple of people who had questions. Um, you can direct all your questions to Eric um, out in the hall as we need to continue the meeting. But the other thing that I, I want to add is that one of the things about conditional uses is what was said was true. The planning commission has to approve them if any sort of negative impact can be reduced. But conditional uses, if they continue, if they create issues, uh, nuisances, et cetera, they can also be revoked. And so one of the one of the things that the city relies on with that is the input from the neighbors. Over time, once that ADU is established, um, if if there is a violation or nuisances that are created. Um, to report those to the city because then we can initiate a process to to potentially revoke a conditional use as well. So. And that would be through zoning enforcement, right? Yeah, that was where it would start. Okay. Did you have a car? Uh, I need to send it to you. Yeah. Talk to Eric. I think talk to Eric and he can get contact right. information. Thank you, everyone. Oh, is it approved? Approved. Yes, it was approved. Next item on the agenda, conditional use for ADU at approximately 235 East Hubbard, case number PLN PCM 2019-00995. Okay. Linda. Good evening. So as mentioned, this is a conditional use approval request for a detached accessory dwelling unit on a property located at 235 East Hubbard, which is also in the R1 5,000 single family residential. And that is actually a current photo of the single family residence, the subject property. The proposed detached ADU would be located in the northeast corner of the rear yard. The building <coughs> footprint is approximately 432 square feet. The parking space for this would actually be located on street along Hubbard Avenue, as you can kind of see here in the blue, as shown there. And the subject property is also located one quarter of a mile of a transit stop. And the nearest bus stop is located approximately on 900 South and 200 East. Mm -hmm. So just a little bit more of a site visit photo. To the top left is actually the location of the proposed ADU in the, in the northeast corner. So originally there was a detached garage, but that was removed a couple of weeks after the submittal of the ADU application. And to your top right, you will see a general review of that whole entire rear yard. So you can kind of see the abutting properties. And to the bottom left is standing on the driveway, the existing driveway, and looking towards where the proposed ADU would be located. And lastly, this is a photo of the closest single family dwelling on the adjacent property, which would be approximately 15 feet from the proposed ADU. No comments were received, um, either from the community council or public comments. So the proposal generally meets all the applicable standards as discussed in attachment E and F of the staff report and based on the findings and information in the staff report, planning staff is recommending the planning commission approve the conditional use request for the proposed ADU with the conditions listed in the staff report. This concludes Great. my presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Linda? I'm just going to say thanks, Linda, for all the photos. That was very helpful. You're welcome. <laughs> the report as I read it. <laughs> Thank you. OK. Any questions for the applicant in this instance? OK. I'm seeing none. Um, Do you have any questions oh, for yeah. the applicant? Yeah, applicant. I do. Sorry. I was looking at that. So in one of those photos, um, Andrea, there's um, the driveway that abruptly ends. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks like it extends a little bit behind the house. Is there room to then not do a tandem parking and, and do two? I can't. It doesn't look like it, but I don't know if they can go in um, a 90 degree angle. Or how they how do they park? Do they park all the way back there? Do they park up yeah, front? Yeah, so they they did have a detached garage and they did take it down, um, like she said, a little bit after we submitted for the application. So I think they were originally parking in the garage, but oh. once it got demoed, we showed the tandem parking style on the site plan in the driveway for yeah. the two primary residents. Um, so I I feel like there's potential to add another parking spot onto the driveway, but I know that's a requirement to be behind the front facade of the building. 
Oh, so. because I guess in the front of the house, I mean, you could easily have two cars parked there and still use the single for car garage or yeah. the single driveway because yeah. it's so much wider. Yeah, okay. I agree. All right. That's all I had. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. All right, we'll ask you to step back. I'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone here who'd like to speak? Okay, Zach. Zach Dussel, uh, I'm in favor of this application. I'd like to propose a um, alternate transit vision for this um, site or transportation vision uh, than the car. Uh, third south, or correction, third east is a protected bike lane that extends to downtown with, um, it looks like you can get to the site to downtown approximately 10 minutes by bike. Um, ninth south has uh, frequent bus service every 15 minutes. Um, and again, we're talking about parking as the constraint for this development. If you, if you give an addict heroin, they're going to keep using heroin and free parking is enabling cars. I, I don't know how to be more clear than that. And it's kind of sad that that's our main concern with these applications. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here who'd like to speak on this item? Okay. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Bring this back to the commission. Um, does anybody have any comments, questions, or discussions? Or would anyone like to entertain a motion? Thank you. All righty, let's do this. Based on the findings listed in the staff report, it is the planning staff's opinion that the overall project generally meets the application applicable standards and therefore recommends the Planning Commission approve the planning development request with conditions. <clears throat> and this is regarding PLN SUB 2019-000997. Carolyn, would you mind restating it as you move the Planning Commission to approve? You get the wrong one. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Read this. This I, is sheet. Okay. I'll start all over again. Thank you. Thank you. Based on the findings listing in the staff report, the information presented and input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission approve the conditional use request regarding PLNPCM 2019-00995 as proposed, subject to complying with the conditions listed in the staff report. All right, motion by Carolyn. A second. second. Dueling seconds. Second by John. <laughs> All right, let's run down the list. <laughs> John. Yes. Amy. Yes. Brenda. Yes. Carolyn. Agree. Thera? Yes. Matt? Yes. Okay, motion passes. Thank you all. Moving on, agenda item number four. Huddert Lofts at approximately 156 East 900 South, PLN SUB 2019-00997. And we've got Nanette. Thank you, Chairperson. The project site is located at 156 East 900 South and is in the Corridor Commercial District on a corner lot along 900 South and Edison Street. The site currently houses an, exist an existing legal non-complying building, which was built in, 19 in the 1960s. The applicant for the Huddert Lofts project is requesting to add an inline vertical addition to the existing building to create a second and third floor on the building. The proposed Huddert Lofts plan development will be a three-story mixed-use building with residential uses on the third and second floors and an office and residential use on the ground floor. The overall layout of the site will remain the same as what's existing. Through the plan development, the applicant is requesting to modify the front, uh, the front yard, the corner side yard, and the rear yard setbacks 
in order to be in line with the existing building, which currently has no setbacks from the property lines. The front yard setback requirement in the CC district is 15 feet. It's also 15 feet for the corner side yard setback, and there's a 10 foot setback in the rear yard. The applicant is also requesting a modification to the building height. Through a plan development, um, it allows for planning commission to approve an additional height of five feet, um, and the underlining zoning district allows for a maximum height of 30 feet. The Hutter Lofts plan development proposal is 35 foot building height, which lies within the maximum allowed in, through a plan development. Staff has found that the plan develop, the proposed Hoddart Lofts plan development meets the objectives of the plan development chapter in that it facilitates the implementation of the central community master plan through increasing pedestrian mobility and accessibility by enhancing a sense of place um, through providing a building which interacts with the street. The applicant is proposing to include an integrated art piece on the front facade of the building as well as a mural to the, um, on the east facade of the building which adjoins um, or fronts an alleyway to the east. The proposal also includes a greater percentage of windows along all facades of the building than what is presently on the site and it's uh, a greater percentage than what's required in the corridor commercial zoning district. This uh, improves a sense of safety on the street as it creates a sense of visibility from the building. Staff has received two comments from surrounding property owners uh, for the proposed plan development. Um, planning and transportation staff has found that the proposed Hutter Lofts meets the parking standards. Parking is not a modification that the applicant is requesting through the plan development process. The project meets the requirements for parking through the transportation demand management parking incentives by providing secured bar uh, bicycle stalls, locker and showers on site, and an on-premise daycare. Shared parking will also be used as the proposed office will have a different peak parking, uh, will have different peak parking hours um, and day, uh, peak days than residential or, resident, um, residential or restaurant uses. The applicant will provide 45 parking stalls. The minimum uh, required by the zoning code is 43 stalls. It is staff's opinion that, the, that overall the project meets the intent of the zoning district and the plan development standards with the recommended conditions of approval listed in the staff report. Uh, therefore, staff recommends that the planning commission approve the plan development with the following four conditions of approval. Thank you. Any questions for Nanette before we bring the applicant up? Okay, thanks. Is the applicant here? Yes, they are. Okay. If the applicant would like to come forward. Hello, my name is Hong Nguyen. I am one of the managing partners of Sapa Investment Group, and this is our project on 9th South. Just wanted to give a brief intro to who we are. We've been in this neighborhood um, for, for over a decade now. We believe in this neighborhood, we love this neighborhood. We feel like this is the natural extension of downtown. Um, we and we absolutely love adaptive reuse. We're big on it. If you've gone to any of our other businesses in the area, like Sapa um, Sushi Bar or Purgatory, and our upcoming project Food Alley that's around the corner from Herdart, we believe in taking something old and beautiful and making it even better. You can't ever build brand new what you can do with adaptive reuse. So our next project here, Herdart Loft, is true to form where we would like to take an existing building and make it beautiful and an extension of a neighborhood that is th uh, up and coming, thriving in, within this Maven district here. 
So, and Nanette has done an amazing job walking us through this process and kind of presenting what it is we've done to get us to this point to um, present to you guys. So if you have any questions, I can take any questions at this time. Thank you. Any questions for the applicant? Anyone? Um, how wide is the, so um, I'm just looking at the plans now and um, on the second and third floor. Um, and how wide is that corridor through there? The one in the middle, the courtyard? Yeah. In the middle? Uh, you know, my, my drafter's not here right now. It's no more than um, about 10 to 15 feet wide within okay. that corridor. That, that's, that's fine, but um, you're calling, is that on the second and the third floor? It is, sits on the existing f main floor. It sits on the roof of the existing main floor. So the second and third floor where the lofts are will be open to, uh, to right. the Right, so it says on the, so the, se so the second floor has, a, has the corridor, or yes. it has the courtyard, and it's open to the air, yes. correct? Yes, correct. Um, and how do you get to the units on the third floor? Uh, the lofts will have are two floors, so second and third floor lofts oh, are one okay. unit. Okay, all right. Thank you. That, ex that answers my question. Yeah. Thank you. We, we wanted to make it so that they have more windows and natural lighting that comes into each of the units to kind of make it that loft open airy style. So that's why we carved out that area in the middle to kind of make a Japanese style garden is the intent there. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Is the child care a, like a, is it staffed or is it just like a place to go with your family? I'm, I'm sorry, which shop? The child care The place? child care is meant for the staff there because we intend to use it as a SOPA Investments corporate office once it's built out. And so it's intended for the staff of SOPA group to bring child, their child, their children the there for child care. parents could bring their kids and they, it's a child care facility. It's not just like a room, like a playroom. No, it's a child care facility that we would have actual licensed uh, caretakers there. It, the reason why we felt it was necessary to do that is just the cost of child care is astronomical. And so we wanted to make it so it's a well-balanced thing for our employees to be able who are, it's a young staff that we have who's ha um, starting their family. So we want to kind of provide that subsidized child care for them. Can you talk to me about the parking arrangements? So how much parking are you required? Where is this alleyway parking and... So. so we own a, I don't have it available, go ahead, Max. So, this is Max, our uh, lead project manager. So, uh, so our uh, original parking requirement um, is, is 67 stalls, um, or 64 stalls, stalls excuse me. Uh, we have met a number of Salt Lake City's transportation management strategies uh, to have a 25% reduction and that, and as you can see on page nine of our staff report, uh, our table shows, uh, since it's a mixed use building, uh, that the actual, the maximum amount of stalls we will be in use of at any point in the day will be 43, the amount we have uh, supplied for that building. For the actual location of parking, there's some that's off to the west side of the building that's off street parking, and then we actually own a lot that's directly west of it across Edison Street that actually has parking that's off-site parking as well. So the off-site parking is attached to your building in what, how, how is that? I guess I should ask that of the, the, the staff, really. Sort of, how does that work? It's uh, it's right across the street and just down south. Yeah, I'm uh, not asking Edison. that question. I'm asking, I'm asking, how do we know that in the future that lot remains a parking lot for your project? So the the code really requires it to be. Um, it's a little different when the owner is the same, but generally it requires it to be maintained as parking for a period of. Uh, five years. After that, um, the code essentially allows it to go away. Okay. So. And would they need to find or negotiate a, another deal with some other surrounding property owner if it went away, or what would, 
they, just the building could be built with no parking and then it's up to the market to see if they can rent or sell these units without parking correct and so the calculation there gets you 35 so how do we get to 43 so the shared parking calculations, it's dependent on the, the type of day, so a weekday will be different. Than no, no, weekend. I understand how okay. you get your shared parking calculations, but you show 11 on-site and 24 off-site, which gets you 35, and the minimum is 43. So there would also be, um, that was my mistake on the slide, there would also be on-site um, it would be parking in front of Hutter Lofts along 900 South. Okay, so it's kind of on-street parking that's adjacent to the, to the building plus what they're doing on their site plus what they're using off-site. Okay. That's right. I apologize. That was a mistake on the slide. I've checked the um, parking standards as well as um, Michael Berry from Transportation. We both found that it met our it parking standards. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant or staff at this point? Okay, thank you. We will now move on to the public hearing. Um, I'll open the public hearing for this item. Is there anyone here from, well, first let me ask, is there anyone here from the Community Council? I failed to ask that the past couple times. No, okay. Um, so I saw some hands come up. I'll let you go second, Zach. We'll go to the gentleman in the back. Please make sure to state your name into the microphone for the record. It doesn't matter. And you'll have two minutes. Hi, my name is Tim Watke, and I'm an adjoining property owner, and I'm speaking in favor of the project. Um, there's already a pretty vibrant um, mixed-use business and residential and food and beverage um, node already happening here at the Maven District, and I think this would be a great addition to it. And it's also good to see that a building is not being torn down um, if we could, you know, do adaptive reuse as much as possible, I think that's always a good thing. And the parking, we've mentioned many times already tonight about we have plenty of parking and plenty of bus routes and bike routes, so I don't need to beat that dead horse. But, um, again, I'm in favor of the development and think it looks great and be a great addition to the neighborhood. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Okay. There was another hand in the back. Sorry, Zach. I'll make you go third. You're, you're a regular. Hi, uh, Ian Kaplan, I'm a local architect and also a real estate developer, uh, mostly infill, uh, adaptive reuse, small urban plots, and uh, since I was here for the other ones, I saw this one on the agenda and figured I'd speak in support of it just because uh, it is a good urban infill development, it is saving some bones of our city, um, and it's in a great emerging district as well, so uh, Tim, who spoke earlier, has done a really great job of doing some really cool developments in that area, making a walkable neighborhood, um, truly walkable with good neighborhood amenities. And I think this would actually add some support to that already kind of burgeoning uh, district. And uh, I won't talk about parking because I'm sure we're all sick of hearing about it, but uh, I would support the additional height and the increased setbacks because I think a building on the sidewalk is much better for urban environment than being set back and a little more unwelcoming to the pedestrian to kind of leisurely stroll into these establishments so thank you thank you okay zach zach dusselt speaking in favor of this project i guess i'm going to talk about parking uh <laughs> my favorite thing about this project which i didn't even know until um nick brought it up is the um off-street parking removal after five years because um, basically what we're doing right now is we're taking a strip mall, adding housing on top of it. And so we're, it's adaptive reuse, I love that. I love that it's um, keeping an existing structure. And um, I also love that the off street parking across the street, once uh, it's no longer needed, which is obviously the hope with whatever we're doing here, um, will eventually be removed and hopefully replaced with some more housing, some more mixed use development. Um, I don't have any issues at all with this project. I think this is, if we could do this everywhere in the city, then uh, we'd have a much better place to live. It'd be much more equitable. We'd be much further along to our goals of uh, reducing emissions, uh, making a more inclusive city, a safer city, um, one that isn't shackled to the car. Thank you. 
Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? Okay. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission. Any comments or is anyone ready to make a motion? Or do we want to bring staff back? Nothing? I just want to comment that I, I really like the design of this project. I think it, um, it's lively, it's interesting, it shows quite a bit of creativity and I think it's gonna fit really well in this neighborhood. Right. I'm ready to make a motion. Thank you, Amy. Um, just preface it, I also really like the design of this. I think it engages Night South. I can never find where the applicant went when I look back up. In the back. Okay, I think it engages um, Night South really well. So I commend you on that. Um, and so we'll move forward. Based on the findings listed in the staff report, it is the plan, oh no, where are we? This is a different <laughs> layout. Okay, sorry. Based on the information in the staff report, I move that the Planning Commission approve petition PLN SUB 2019-00997 regarding the Huddard Lofts plan development in order to comply with the applicable standards. The following conditions of approval apply. An encroachment permit will be obtained for the eaves projecting into the public right of way prior to building permit approval. Off-site parking will be maintained and available to the patrons and or residents of the building. The design of the project shall be consistent with this staff report and submitted plan development application. Prior to construction, all plans shall comply with all applicable development standards required by city departments. All right. Motion by Amy. Second. Second by John. And let's start with Matt. Yes. Sarah. Um, I'd like to make a comment that, yeah, I agree. I continue to be impressed with SAPA Investments and the, what you guys are doing in this neighborhood and what you're doing for Salt Lake City. So I say a hearty yes to this project. Carolyn. Agree. Brenda. Yes. Amy. Yes. John. Yes. Okay, motion passes. Amy, I'll have you know I wrote down that you liked the architecture, because that might be the first time. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like, you can count it on one hand, that is true. First time for everything. <laughs> I was almost loath to say it because it would be on record, but I do like it. Okay, next item on the agenda, number five, zoning map amendment at approximately 5, 5525 and 5575 west. 1730 South PLN PCM 2019-00726. And we have Mayara. So this is a request to rezone the properties located at 5525 and 5575 West, 1730 South, from CG General Manufacturing to M1 Light Manufacturing, to which planning staff is recommending the commission for a positive recommendation to City Council. Uh, the motivation for this request is to allow additional land uses on the properties and eliminate maximum off-street parking. The subject properties are already developed into two industrial buildings, and the existing uses include warehouse, wholesale, wholesale distribution, and office, which are permitted uses in both the CG and the M1 zoning districts. Um, surrounding the properties, uh, we have CG and M1 and OS, and the adjacent uses include office, truck sales and rental, warehouse and wholesale distribution. Um, the area is predominantly zoned and used as manufacturing. Um, the map on the screen shows that land located west of I-215 and south of I-80 is largely zoned manufacturing, which is the light gray. Um, and the dark gray on the northeast corner is M1. Uh, and in this area, only the properties located along 5600 uh, West are zoned CG, which is shown in red. Um, the CG zone was put in place here in 1995, but these properties never developed to form a commercial corridor. Some are still vacant, um, and those that have been developed have heavy, heavy commercial commercial uses on it, such as the warehouse and wholesale distribution. <clears throat> Excuse me. As discussed in the staff report, the Northwest Quadrant uh, Master Plan envisioned that this area will continue to be industrial, and it's likely that the character of the area will not change. Um, therefore, the proposed M1 is uh, appropriate and will allow compatible development on those properties. The rezone would also eliminate maximum off-street parking. 
Uh, the maximum applies to CG properties uh, in the area, but not to those zoned M1 because the M1 properties located west of Redwood Road are exempt from maximum parking. This exemption was adopted in 2015 in order to support industrial development in the area. Uh, so maximum parking is an important tool to provide pedestrian oriented. However, in this area, it has limited uh, success, especially considering that the requirement only applies to the CG zone properties um, and is not really supported by transportation options in the area. To the property owner, this requirement limits the pool of tenants uh, because parking lot expansion is uh, limited on parking calculations. Planning staff has not received any public comments regarding this application and staff has assessed that the proposed zoning district is not only appropriate for the area, but it would also help further the city's industrial growth plans as discussed in the staff report. Take any questions. Thank you, Myra. Any questions? None. Is the applicant here? Hi, Hi nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Good evening, my name is Eric Eklund. It's a pleasure to be here to talk to you about our uh, proposed zoning map amendment. Uh, first, I wanted to say uh, the staff report thoroughly covered you know, all of kind of our rationale and reason for our application. Um, one thing that was not included as a exhibit um, in, the, uh, in the staff report was a conceptual parking plan that we did for a prospective tenant we could not do because of the limitations on parking under the current zoning. Um, if you, well, you can zoom in. So this was a tenant called Covance. Covance is a pharmaceutical manufacturing company. As you might imagine, they have pretty heavy employment needs within their spaces. And so when they came and talked to us about leasing in the space, which was about 54,000 square feet, in order to accommodate their needs, we would have to add more parking. Um, at the time, because we had the CG zone, we were unable to accommodate the request. We did put together this map to kind of show you where additional parking would occur as a logical kind of transformation of the project as it goes to a higher build out than just traditional warehouse. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. We're happy to be here. We're excited to be in Salt Lake City. This is our first investment here. Um, my son goes to the U, so <laughs> we're excited. Thank you. Any questions for the applicant? Yes, is that a uh, roadway running between, is that a roadway running between those two buildings? No, that's a shared truck courtyard. Okay. I think what you're talking about, that just shows an easement, um, those dotted lines, it's not a road. Okay, so the easement is a public easement? No, or it's not, it's, it's just for use shared between the two legal parcels. I see. So the public streets are 5600 west on the, uh, West, <laughs> 1730 south on the north and 5500 west on the east. Yeah, I think I got that right. I welcome Salt Lake. Oh, I know. I'm still, <laughs> I'm still trying. <laughs> right, if you get that right, you won't be like me. You showed up at the wrong ninth and ninth. <laughs> Any? <laughs> that, that's impressive, Brenda. <laughs> Any other questions for the applicant? Okay. Thank you. I will ask you to step back, open the public hearing. Is there anyone here who would like to speak on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll close the public hearing, and bring this back to the commission. Any questions or clarifying comments? I'll make a motion. Great, thanks. Based on the information in the staff report, the information presented and the input received in the public hearing, I move the Planning Commission recommend the City Council approve the proposed zoning map, map amendment as presented in the petition PLN PCM 2019-00726. Okay, I'll got second a that. Motion by Matt, a second by Sarah. Let's start with John. Yes. Amy. Yes. Brenda. Yes. Carolyn. Agree. Sarah? Yes. Matt? Yes. Okay, motion passes as this is a zoning map amendment. This now goes to the city council for final approval. So thank you. Yeah. Okay, next item on the agenda, what we're all waiting for, number yes. six. 
proximity requirements in the city's adopted fire code. I'm starting the timer. <laughs> you should. Um, so this doesn't sound like it's exciting, but this is actually a very significant change to the fire code. The city's able to make this change because this particular section is in the appendix of the code, and the state legislature has authorized cities to choose whether or not to adopt or adopt in modified form the appendices. So yay for, for the state for doing something right with fire code. Um, Basically, this is, we are recommending approval of this. this. is something that we've been working on for several years with the fire department, transportation, engineering, uh, public services, you name it. This is, a lot of people have been involved with this. Um, this is what the current code basically requires and why this is an issue is because there are over 18,000 parcels of land in Salt Lake City where the property line sits more than 30 feet away from the curb line. What that means for this particular section of the code is that any building over 30 feet in height needs to have an aerial access road and it has to meet be no closer than 15 feet and no further than 30 feet from the road so if you can picture main street is 32 feet away under this code you could not build the buildings on main street that exist today um, the proposal would be in if there is enhanced in, um, fire protections built into the building that that distance can be reduced to both 10 feet or increased to 50 feet. What this means is that we are going to stop seeing our park strips cut into. We're going to uh, be able to maintain bike infrastructure, our street trees, and a bunch of other things, whereas right now we can't. Plus, it also means that the fire department legally, and I put that in air quotes because when they respond, they use the street for their response. That's, that's where they would prefer to be, um, at least when they initially pull up to, to an incident. Um, and so one of the things that's happening is, particularly in East Downtown, the curb lines are being moved, our on-street parking is going away, we've had issues with bike lanes being removed, uh, we've lost street trees, we're lo losing our green space, all because people are moving the curb sometimes as little as two or three feet just to meet this code. Uh, what this does is that it says that if you're going to do these things with your building code, making it so that there's uh, safer spaces in the building if there was a fire, um, that you can no longer move the curb. You have to either meet this proposed code or the existing code. The existing code still stays there. So if you're closer to 30 feet, you can use the road without doing anything different. Um, and that is really the extent of the uh, presentation. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And I really wish I would have remembered to let the fire department know to be here because they <laughs> they wanted to, they actually wanted to be here. They have been, the Fire Prevention Bureau has been an amazing partner in trying to find this uh, solutions to this situation. And um, here we are. Thank you, Nick. <clears throat> Questions, Brenda? I, I'm not, ha well, I do have a question. The question is, is the fire department, um, is this uh, even slightly compromise the safety of any Salt Lake residents? It does not, and the reason it doesn't is because there is an enhanced um, techniques into the built, built into the building in order for the fair aerial access road to be further away. Furthermore, we actually did a, a study of the ladder reach for the trucks in the areas where the um, wh where most of these parcels are, particularly in the east downtown, and and the uh, with with the type of construction that really is creating this, it's really the um, the smaller scale things, the type one, the steel construction. They don't really have an issue with that, um, and they don't they're not using their ladder trucks to rescue people. It's it's simply for either getting getting crews on the roof or fighting the fire. And they have no problem reaching those, those building heights even at 50 feet. Is the fire department coming? Is that what you were gonna say? Yeah, yeah they're on their I, way. I, 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 I called 911 and they're coming. <laughs> 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 Any other questions for Nick? Okay, thank you, Nick. Thank you. Now move to the public hearing. I'll open the public hearing. Is anyone here who would like to speak? Zach. Just in case. Zach Dussault, speaking in favor. Uh, I'll keep it short. It sounds like this could uh, 
really increase the viability of certain structures in the city, particularly those of uh, higher height and uh, lots that typically couldn't get developed. And I think that is very consistent with the goals of uh, what we're trying to do as a, as a city. So in support, thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing, bring it back to the commission. Would anyone like to make I will. I will make a motion. Thank you, Brenda. Based on the information in the staff report, the information presented, and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission recommend that the City Council approve the proposed amendments to Chapter 18.44 Fire Prevention and International Fire Code as presented in the staff report. Okay. We've got a motion by Brenda and a second by the Fire Department. <laughs> Just kidding. Second. <laughs> Second by John. Okay, let's start with Matt. Yes. Sarah. Yes. Carolyn. Agree. Brenda. Absolutely. Amy. Yes. John. Yes. Okay, that's a good one. All right, that brings us to the end of the public hearings, and we move on to the work session. Uh, we've got two items. The first is the Salt Lake Crossing at approximately 470 West, 200 North, PLN PCM 2019-01106. Nanette. Thank you, Chairperson. So the purpose of this work session is for Planning Commission to provide direction to the applicant uh, so they can finalize their design review proposal and bring the application back to Planning Commission for your final decision for the design review. Um, Salt Lake Crossing is a proposed mixed-use building with residential office and a restaurant on the ground floor. The building will include six stories total with residential and office uses on second through six floors and a restaurant and parking um, and a dog wash on the first floor. The site is a corner lot with frontages along 490 West and 200 North and it is located in the Transit Station Area Urban Center Core District. The project is located in a unique area of the city where pedestrian activity and site visibility is currently limited. Even though the project is located across the street from the North Temple Front Runner Station, pedestrian activity is minimal as those using the Front Runner Station um, will directly access a bus stop or bus stops on the west side of 490 West before continuing to other destinations in the city. The site also has limited visibility as the street um, dead ends from 200 North and 490 West um, at this location. The site also has um, the the site is also um, at a location where the pedestrian and uh, bicycle in infrastructure improvements are proposed to be made. The site will be more trafficked by pedestrians and bicyclists as the existing North Temple Front Runner Station, the North Temple Light Rail um, Station, and the bike lane along, along 300 North will be, at, uh, will be added to by a proposed pedestrian bridge on 300 North, a pedestrian priority path along 300 North, and an improved North Temple Viaduct pedestrian walkway and street access, which will allow for access um, to the gateway to the south. The applicant is requesting four modifications to the design standards in the TSA district. The first is a modification of the building facade length facing a street. The maximum per, uh, permitted street facing facade length is 200 feet. The applicant is proposing 450 um, building length along the 490, uh, 490 West facade. The property to the immediate east of the project site also has a similar facade length uh, as the proposed Salt Lake Crossing. The upper flight five floors of the building will have an intermittent step back, which will create a um, column appearance. However, the ground floor of the building will not be stepped back intermittently, uh, but will instead include green walls uh, between the columns above. There was- Define, define green walls for me. Um, so on this slide is an example of one of the proposed green, um, green walls on the second photo. So it will be um, 
a, a type of screen that will allow for a vine to crawl up the wall. So the modification to the ground floor use and visual interest um, requirement is also proposed to be modified. The TSA district requires an 80% ground floor use other than parking along a street facing facade. The TSA district allows for a reduction on ground floor use other than parking of 60% if 25% additional visual interest or design is proposed on the building. Salt Lake Crossing is proposed with 18% active ground floor uses um, that would include a cafe on 200 North and a dog wash across the street from the, dog, from the existing dog park. Uh, Salt Development is also proposing art displays along the 490 West facade in order to activate the street um, and provide pedestrian interest to the building. Technically, it doesn't meet the ground floor um, use requirement as it doesn't extend 25 feet into the building, however. The last two modifications SALT development is requesting is a modification to the ground floor glass and required, park, uh, required building entrances along the street facing facade. The TSA district requires 60% glass on the ground floor and all of the proposed glass must be transparent and provide at least five feet of visual depth into the building. The 490 West facade on Salt Lake Crossing is proposed with 32% glass, uh, the bulk of which will include the art displays, which would be available to local artists. The final modification requested for this project is the building entry requirement of one building entrance every 40 feet of street facing facade. Uh, the facade facing 490 West does not meet this standard and a building entrance separation is provided at approximately every 80 feet. So even though many of the design standards in the TSA zoning district um, are being met, planning staff still has concern with the ground floor um, along the 490 West building facade. The ground floor along this facade does not meet a significant number of required design standards in the district. Um, while mo modifying certain standards may be appropriate due to the unique configuration of the site and its location, um, staff's, staff is still concerned um, about whether the intent of the design standards chapter of the zoning code uh, can be met with the number of modification requested on the ground floor. Um, I've provided a number of questions that planning commission can consider when facilitating discussion with the applicant and um, to provide direction to the applicant as well. Uh, the first is involves uh, the building length and um, one question is to consider whether does exceeding the maximum length of the building negatively impact pedestrian accessibility along 490 West? The second is regarding visual interest. Do the proposed modifications to the design standards allow for a pedestrian friendly walkable site or is the proposal too, still too car, too car centric? Um, with the ground floor use, with limited active ground floor uses, do the design elements proposed on the building building sufficiently merit a pedestrian oriented street and the ground floor glass are the limited number are the limit, limited ground floor uses and visibility to the street detrimental to the accessibility and safety of pedestrians all right thank you Nanette and the applicants here okay I want to bring the applicant up and we can start the conversation Yeah, we need you to have sit at the microphone. I wasn't going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> My architect was. Uh, yeah, so I don't know if you've had a chance to see it, but we're salt development. We care very much about what we build. We care very much about the impact it's going to have long after we're gone. 
uh, we came to a location six years or so ago, seven years ago, that had been left in disarray, as you might, if you can remember, what was across from uh, West High School, and, um, and had a vision that maybe something good could happen. We call it the forgotten corner of the city. Uh, most local developers didn't want to deal with it and mess with it and touch it. We've, we've since then come in and uh, revitalized that area, established a, what we like to call hardware district uh, in respect of the Salt Lake hardware building that's there. And in fact, that this historic building here is really what's created w what we've designed on the site itself. So Fourth West uh, was the first uh, project. In fact, we had, we had uh, we chose a name. We were warned not to by local marketing people. That's a bad part of town. You don't want to go to the west side. And we just said, no, we're going with it. It's fourth west. We're very, very proud of what's happened there. Um, the next project was hardware uh, apartments, both west and east. And again, we wanted to do something that was very respectful of what was going on. So we created projects that uh, um, you know, reflected maybe what had existed you know, with the, with the uh, railroad admin building or warehouses that were reclaimed. We tried to, we actually spent a lot of time, energy trying to figure that out. We feel like we've done that. The front building is, is, is we try to be reminiscent of a like 1930s Ritz-Carlton that may have been built in an urban setting with the holdout of a town, set of townhouses, if you saw it on Salt Street, that uh, we had to build around. The reason I'm sharing this is we, we have a tremendous amount invested in this area. We care very, very much about what's being built here. We believe the variances that we're requesting are very reasonable, and we believe the building, even the, the pedestrian experience that we're going to present, are going to be very, very accepted and beautiful. Um, it doesn't meet the letter of the law, but when you consider the fact that we face a train track, and you take a look at the surrounding uh, areas around, neighborhoods both uh, north and south of us, I think what we've created here is exceptionally wonderful and beautiful. And by the way, I love what the, uh, the young gal was, uh, the project brought up. I love seeing the, yes, I Happen. love that, that flavor and style going up in town too. So with that, I'll let the guys talk who's supposed to talk. Yeah, great. Um, so I'm David Holzberg. I'm the architect with the Method Studio for, for this project. And before I jump in, we have the, some additional si slides that give the flavor of the project. But before I jump into that, I want to see if there's any questions as we try to address the, um, the specific uh, zone, or, um, zoning variances that we're looking at. If so not, can you, sorry, just That's move that. <laughs> it blocks the view of us. <laughs> sorry. He's, he's, a, he's in construction. <laughs> I would just say speak as much as you can to the pedestrian. Uh, I've been in your buildings. I know the amenities are nice, but I want to hear how it's a, a space for community. Mm -hmm. So talk yeah. to that, please. Absolutely. So in this project, like Thomas had, had mentioned, um, we've kind of showed just the, the evolution, and that which is exactly shown right here. So I'll kind of skip through this as we get closer to the, the project itself. Um, so in Salt Lake Crossing, again, this the the pedestrian experience of coming off from the, the buses that are in this area and then also the train is a pretty high traffic area as far as the, the, the um, public transit that is happening here. Um, but as you turn heading towards 4th West and towards the high school students that are coming from the west side in this pedestrian, this corridor, um, the ground floor use is, is something that we've, since we've been working with Nanette, have, have dressed up uh, quite a bit and have added um, uh, SALT has added uh, significant resources into trying to beautify that experience and making sure that we've going from a concrete wall to something that is um, block a little bit more human scale on the, not on the scale or sorry of the size of the of the block itself and adding these these windows and this art experience so that we as we move between the the colonnade of the of the project we have these micro parks that are in between that offer that additional waiting area um, space uh, on the in-between so it does break up that facade and make sure that you're not walking, looking at a, a series of, of parking along this whole experience. So that the parking is essentially hidden um, beyond this. Um, again, just we, we talked about that, so I'll kind of skip through these. These are some of the images that talk about the, the flavor of our project. Um, and this, again, some of the, the context that is on the fourth, on the east side of, of where the hardware district is. 
And then also on the other side of the tracks, this is what our project faces on the, uh, the west side of the, of the train of the Union Pacific Line and also the, uh, the front runner line. Um, and this, this right here being our, our project site. So this is the pedestrian, oh, here we go. The pedestrian access, access running through here where that bike lane and the, the pedestrian bridge will be proposed and as part of the, the ultimate master plan for Salt Lake City. Um, getting into those, uh, just the variances here, um, the, as we went, went for the ground floor use of, um, on our phase one approach is, is what we're looking at now is trying to have something that's economically viable for the project. Um, parking has, has, been a, has been a common theme of the, of the night here. And uh, as of right now, to meet the, the TSA zoning requirement is one stall per unit. And right now, we're at 0.63 stalls per unit. Um, still hedging the bet on that these, um, these units that are micro units and studios that we're moving away from the car. And some of those stalls that we are providing are um, their rideshare Teslas that residents can check out and get around where they need to in the city. Um, and so still understanding that this, this generation and, and this, uh, the car will be going away, but as of right now, it's, it's still there and it's a necessity. Um, the phase two that we, or sorry, and again with the, the art displays is something that is on that, that smaller scale, allowing for public art working with the high school just across the street, but having something that has visual interest for those who are walking along. So again, it's not just a, a um, you know, the same kind of facade. Go so ahead. the... So I understand those, that's just a very shallow place for art. That's not a storefront at all. But, and that's an entrance to yeah, yeah, the so apartments? What that is, that, that's a future retail space. We're gonna show you here in a minute. Oh, it is future so retail? There is, there's, we believe that cars are gonna go away. Zach's probably gonna be happy to hear that. We, we believe that too. We, we actually, in all of our projects, could be offering electric vehicles here since awesome. they don't even need to have a car. They can borrow one if they need it. But we, we, uh, we see these areas as future, and go ahead. Yeah. He'll show you, he'll, he'll lay it out for oh, you. Oh, so as you answer that, are these entrances to the apartment building? They, they would be entrance, no, those would be entrance into the retail. That's entrance, so, so it's not along an that active whole use. 400 foot, there's no way to get into the building there is, from yes. that side? Okay, I wanna see that too, as you're explaining that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have entrances. Um, so this would still be entrances into the, the parking area, which is direct access. Right behind this is where you get to the elevators. Um, so from the street, if you're a resident here, you'll be able to get directly to, the, um, to your, your resident, which, where you live. Um, and then there's access through the, the dog wash area into here, and then also access on the, um, just around the corner actually here on, the, on 200 North. Um, so these are, these are not false entrances. They're, they're full entrances into the into the, the building. I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, on hardware east and west, we actually surrounded the entire buildings with front porches. Yeah, I'm familiar. I walk, th I walk these neighborhoods a lot and I, uh, let me commend you. I really love what you guys are doing there. Um, I, but I do wanna talk about walkability. So I wanna finish your presentation, but I do have further questions. Okay, so great. go ahead. Um, so the, the micro parks we're talking about is, is that you have the, the vegetation that's coming from down above and then also growing from below, and this would be a screen um, that is still open to the parking that's beyond this, but again, trying to find, try to find, uh, define that small microclimate um, that, that is not as harsh as what you see across the street. Um, and then this is our phase two, is, is again, as that the, the car goes away, um, and we see that, that trend, that the retail will actually extend all the way through here and taking up a full row of parking that's in there. So the zoning requires 25 feet, and this would be 26 feet depth running the full length of the building. And so all those storefronts that are, that are holding the art now become storefronts for, for projects, or, or sorry, for a retail space, or you know, whatever that, that commercial use might be. Um, and then, so in just a quick plan view of this is, this is what we're proposing right now. When you cite that 0.63 parking per unit, is that before or after that your before, that's so, before, so we will be dropping so you have down less there. Which, yeah. which says 0.63 also includes its parking, it's uh, for public parking too as well inside the building because we see right now what happens is the cars all, there's no parking really much down there already and they just basically, if you ever go down where the buses are, they back up because they're dropping people off and picking people up. 
Uh, right now, Hardware Office is now closed off that parking lot. I don't know if you've noticed, but they put the arms out there. And so it really starts, people need a place to pull over while they're waiting for somebody to get off the train. And so we see, that's why our coffee shop is so important there in the corner as well too. So it'd be used for them as well too. Mm -hmm. so, so as you talk, um, one of the variances you're requesting is the reduction um, of openings every 40 feet to every 80 feet. And, and that rendering, because of all of the wonderful greenery, is kind of hard to determine how that looks spatially Mm -hmm. If you could just kind of point out some of those entrances and, and why oh, yes. um, the 80 feet is preferable to you because I can't quite get a feel of like where they are in the distance and how that's relating to walkability because you have all the wonderful greenery showing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So the um, we have entrances to the building that are here, here, and then... Um, and then also right here. And then so it, as you can see, it fits with the rhythm of the building, again, trying to tie it into the, of the design of the space itself. And then we have that park area, and then here, and then here are where those entrances are. Um, and that's an access to a garage? This is, yes. This is the drive, the, the one, the in and out, the single in and out of the garage. So if, so if I have an apartment in that middle building, can I use any of those entrances to get into my building? Yeah. Okay, they're all, so there is a, they're all connected once Bob, you get through the doors. Just, right, yeah. right, 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 of course. But, yeah. okay, good. Okay, thanks. Yeah. You know, I, if you could go back to, we had some precedent or what was going, some of those shots, a neighborhood shot. There's a project which ex, uh, just came online uh, a block, um, I guess, east of us called Sky House. Are you familiar with Sky House? If you take a look at their street line, that meets your requirements. I mean, there it is on the lower left. That, that meets all your requirements. I'm just asking for some help, some mercy here. We're trying to do something beautiful. Can I just add that the con those requirements have changed since that sky house came through <laughs> Yeah, as a result of not just well, that, but on other streets as well. I mean, we, you know, SALT has come to town. We don't ask the city for money. We don't ask for anything. We come and we, we try to do the, the best beautiful stuff we can do. The other thing this project has done, it's created the most dense opportunity to create even more doors. We will have, we have put 1,250 doors just in our little space there. And that's what you guys, we got the best cross of, of, of transit. You talk about getting rid of bikes and everything. That's what we're doing here. So, and we have to have some parking. I mean, we're already now half of what, uh, you know, we have to have some, so to do that, we have to ha be there. So the question is, how do we now deal with this and then be able to transform it later? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pleading with you here a little bit, but it's like, we, we are good people and we do great work. And I just ask you to consider that. I'm sorry. No, a, little that, a little passion comes out when you talk. No. <laughs> and that, that transform later is, is what I'll show in, in plan here, which we had shown. Uh, previously, so the green is is our micro parks that we have, and the 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 yellow that you're seeing here are our um, just the art spaces, um, and then just again that that ride share those vehicles that we have, as we as the project moves forward, um, this and as, as a future date again as the the pedestrian activity is increased by that bike lane and by the the pedestrian bridge that happens, we will take this this full um, this parking aisle still allowing access to the the level that's below. Um, increase the amount of rideshare vehicles that we have, and then those entrances being able to go to, to these uh, larger pads. Still keeping the micro, um, the, uh, micro um, parks that we have, but having that facade, that storefront facade filled behind it, so now we're looking through the greenery and just and trying to activate the, the green inside the space, the spaces themselves. So, so I'm sorry, John, go. Oh, I was just gonna ask, so as that expansion happens, um, are those doors still being used to access the building? So is there going to be a hallway that splits up all those units between each door? Added or how doors, are you right? planning That's to They're added doors. That's adding what my question was. Adding doors. You're adding, adding doors. doors. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we've already got in our plans the <coughs> penetrations, the future uh, plumbing required for these locations. And I mean, it's all preset already in our, in our slab. So I'm just wondering with the expansion of this, then with those added doors, do you come more closely to meeting um, an entrance every 40 feet? See, I, I it's, it feels like that's what you're moving towards. Not, not to question the brilliance of, of, you know, 
codes and zones. But what, what dictated 40 feet and why and what's, what's the thinking behind it? I could take you to a number of wonderful, beautiful buildings that don't meet that requirement. And well, the reason I'm well. asking is because I think that makes it a little bit more palatable in looking at your future plans to activate um, that area as the pedestrian activity grows. Um, and so as, as I consider in this work session, you know, whether it's important or not, I think that helps the, the future vision kind of feel that it is going to become more active because I think that's the intent for me of the entrances is we have business districts that have way too long a space between doors and then they become very uninviting to people. That's not saying your building is uninviting to people, but um, we've seen many instances in the business district I live adjacent to where um, they become something that nobody wants to walk by, nobody has any interest in them. So I'm really looking at that question in terms of like how, yeah, you do grow and how then you continue to activate to that pedestrian because I'm interested in, in making it something people are enjoying walking by that people want to go to. Um, to draw. I wanted this to be a draw to them. And so, and so that's why I was just, yeah. it seems like you actually then are going to be adding more of that visual and interaction as you grow with your proposed expansion vision. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I want to add to that too. Just going back, we, we were able to master plan. We had the op very lucky to have contiguous blocks to work on so we could master plan what, was what the end result was going to be. Go back to the, uh, the, the stage that showed everything built out, including station, because it's going to impact what's going to happen. Right, right now, that's a primary bus stop. Those bus stops are going to be moving. I just want to comment that anything that's said away from the microphone isn't going to be part of the record, so good. just keep that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Amy, I, I understand what you're saying. I actually like that I'm okay with the doors being a little farther away because of the design of the building. I get what they're after. Um, I oh, I agree with you. It's the context of the building makes it a um, very different feel. Yeah. In the question of what was the intent to me, sure. the intent of that, as I've seen it relate in buildings that exist, maybe are older, even some newer ones, that is the intent as I interpret it and look at it, but the context of your overall design is um, creates a different environment that I agree with what you're saying. Um, and it also then, but taking into account a little bit of the overall hub that you just talked about, but that's not on the record, but <laughs> the future expansion Just a work of, session for the record. Yes, yeah, yeah. of the uh, of the spaces itself helps helps me think about that variance question. So I I agree with you, but and what I was saying is I'm okay with those doors. What I do have issue with, and so I want to try and figure out because I do love this plan. I like I said I love what you guys are doing in the neighborhood. Um, the continuous 400 feet, even with those green walls, that bothers me a little. And I don't know if, because now that I understand that first floor is all parking, I thought it was courtyard behind, but can we push those green walls back even 
a couple of feet to add some dimension. Very, very good point, and it and it is somebody so, somebody put said, little cars there. <laughs> yeah. So 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 what's happening is is if the storefronts are actually built out by I think about two or three feet already. Those those green those uh, uh, green walls are actually back. So you actually have more. They are the, back a little because I didn't see that. The comment was made. It's a picture. straight. It's a straight wall. Yeah. It's not. The building articulates going in and out, going down the front. So as you're walking, you're going to see you, the. You can undulation. see it in the rendering here that it sets back yeah. a little bit, and I, I think the intent of the code that overlays this area is to create spaces more like this where it's pedestrian friendly. You don't want just a big blank wall for 400 Agreed. feet. Agreed. That, yeah. That's the idea. And I think you guys are You think they're there. meeting it? Yeah. We, I we, would agree. This is a million and a half dollars more to do this, just so you know. I no, mean, when we, I we, originally, we had, this is awesome. Yeah. When I originally looked at this, I would never have, from these renderings, felt like it was a 400 and plus foot long. So you've done a really good job, I think, of visually breaking that up and those recesses are very helpful. So I, to me, the 400, normally I am really focused on the 200 feet because they become these just yeah. big wall, but you haven't done that. And I feel like in this particular case, that variance seems appropriate because of how you've treated it really well. So, so just so you know, we're not just playing games because we don't. If, you, if you've been watching our projects, we're very serious about what we do and our intentions, we're very intentional about what we do. These art spaces that we have before retail go in, we have relationships with West High School. Uh, we have a mentoring program at our Fourth West project that, for the kids there. We have the uh, photography cat class that comes over. They can use it because our buildings are kind of real interesting for them to take pictures, the kind of period, you know, the 1930s, 1940s. They do that. We see giving these spaces to them, possibly the other uh, art department at the U, we see these being activated. We see these hopefully be something that will draw people to come and, and, and check it out, what's going to happen seasonally. So we're very intentional about that. So can you talk to me, Dave, about the uh, facade on the alleyway between the two buildings? Or whether it's a, the private road or whatever it is? Yeah, it's so it's a private road between those two. Um, and so there's the parking face that's on um, the, the existing 400 West. Yes. But the facade, the, tr the treatment here is, is the similar on the same side. Um, so you'll still have the, the same feel that's happening on that. We're taking the material and wrapping it around. Because we are right on the lot line, um, the, the micro parks are something that won't happen on that side, but the fenestration treatment will be the same. Um, you'll see the same so materials. So it's, li it's, it's likely that people will also walk along there, or there's no entrance there, or what? Oh, I'm sorry. It's a fire access lane um, running through there, so it's just vehicle entrance. There isn't, um, uh, there's sidewalk that's on the, four, the 400 west side. Yeah. Um, but on this side, it's again, it's right up against the lot line. It's that long, slender site. It's, okay. it's where all the trash containers exist. I think I've actually, here, I'm going to see if I can help. Sorry. It I don't, doesn't, it's oh, not contiguous, right? You can't drive through there for any reason. It is not. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a dead, dead end. end. <clears throat> well, so, you can drive through. So there. there's the sidewalk well, that walks through, through here yes. on the four, um, the 400 West apartments. And right. this, again, this is a private access, but this is the existing fire lane that will serve this project right so here. So the, the, those are like units that are right on the street or right on the level of the sidewalk, right? Yes, so up, to, up to where you see this little step right here, this is a parking garage. Okay, and am I right that on the entrances on 490 West, when you go in those, you're in a, you open the door, you're in a parking garage. That's correct. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. So it's not like, here's your lobby. So yeah. there is no lobby. There, there are lobbies. In not, the garage. not on 490, but off of 200. Or sorry, um, there is lobbies inside the, through the um, as you're heading up into the building. Um, right, there's a, there's a building one. elevator lobby on each yes. floor, That's of correct. course, but in there's the not a too. formal lobby, so there's not a, the experience of walking into your building and going. So how does a guest approach this building? How many? What is the public access to this building? So the public access, like Thomas had mentioned is as you come in, this is all par uh, public parking that will happen on this side. So there is access into the, the lobby, um, which is a, a grand uh, lobby that is part of the amenity building. And this is where there will be, um, it's staffed all the time and that you'll have, uh, <clears throat> this is where your, your, where your guests will come. And, and so that's off 200 North. So if you're a pedestrian, you would access via if the main lobby entrance. Come in both yeah. sides, correct. So you have, um, so so this is a double-loaded corridor building that's got a 400-foot corridor? 
Um, it is broken up by those courtyards. There's a plan. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah. I wasn't able to find a plan in our package. Sorry. Sorry, I keep going back and forth. Hopefully, this isn't getting it to me. There we go. Um, so with that, uh, the uh, menu building, that connection, and so these are the courtyards that are happening on both sides. So it's not a long, that courtyard, or sorry, the, uh, the long hallway is broken up by courtyards. I see. Um, and that's what you see, the, the vegetation from those micro parks that come So if I'm a resident, I come in through the parking garage, right, normally, mm -hmm. right? And if I'm a, so. If you drive, if you have a car. Otherwise, if you have a car, you, correct. If you take front runner, you come in through the front runner station is and you go up to where the bus stop is. The reason and that I'm asking these questions is that I am concerned about the pedestrian experience and about where the people who are living here and also coming here are interesting, are coming in and going out because that's what actually determines you know, the, the, what's on the street, I mean, how many people are actually on the street. So if we're saying that most of the pedestrians <clears throat> who are pedestrians will focus on coming in on 200 South. That's the front door. North. No, excuse north. me, 200 yes. North, correct, yes. sorry. That's the front door, so to speak. And that you have a long internal corridor um, Serving the whole building. We have longer corridors in our project at Fourth West than this. Yeah, yeah. So it's, a, it's it's a design. It's a function of design. <coughs> what we can do there. And then what happens on the northern end? On this this northern end. So yeah. this is our utility yard that is um, that is screened off, and we'll have lots of trees. That was part of the, the comments that we were responding to is uh, for the capital community district um, or community council. Sorry. Um, we'll have a large uh, helical ramp that uh, gets you access down down below. Um, the initial hope was to um, is to you know we understand with parking not having that up, but the, there's a really high water table in this area that is that has been uh, difficult, <clears throat> especially with the long slender site. So, is there any green space requirement in the zoning for this particular site? Open space requirements? Um, not for this, not that I'm aware of in this, this specific area. And is there, an, um, other than the plaza that you've just talked about on 400, I mean, excuse me, on um, North Temple, is there any additional um, open space amenities on this site that you're providing? So we have, there's the, the open space which will happen here, which again is part of the utility, the back of house area here, but you can see the property line um, is zero lot line, again, according to the TSA requirement. Um, you can see that the, there's a wedge shape that happens here, so those micro parks get larger as you get closer to the north. <clears throat> Madam, Madam Chair, uh, there is a outdoor usable space requirement in this zone. I'm guessing just looking at this, that those courtyards that they have shown more than meet that minimum requirement. And this is probably for Nick too. I don't, there's no talk about any kind of mid block walkway. Is that because we're not downtown? It wouldn't connect. Uh, it, it's, yeah, it's because we don't have a, a plan that shows them. Um, I, w I would, I mean, there, technically there is one that goes through that alley. It just doesn't, there's not an east west one. But if we don't have a plan that identifies it, then we can't enforce it. We can't really require it otherwise. Okay. So. In in this case, the, the, because of this, because of the project exists behind it, that's where the primary garage is. So any kind of a middle breakthrough would be running right into a garage. Right. Literally, that there's no right pedestrians. Up. There's just cars coming and going. Can you talk about vertical circulation really quick? Just it looks like the elevators are every other courtyard, or how does that work? That's correct. So we have, these are the two elevators. Um, we've, where they're high speed elevators um, uh, that will run the, the full height. And then we also have a double elevator um, that happens in the amenity building that will feed to. So vertical circulation is there's a series of four elevators that okay. serve the building. And there are high speed just because we, no one likes waiting for an elevator. <laughs> Will you have uh, recyclable containers? Yes, yeah, so the main trash is in the middle of the building and we'll have a divider there that then through the trash chutes that are inside and then trash pickup happens, um, we'll all be inside and then when trash happens, these get wheeled out to the curb and it'll get picked up and um, trash and recycling in that area. 
Thank you. And how many units is this project? It's 300. There's 150 micro units and 150 studio units. Describe a micro unit for us. So the micro units are um, about 230 um, feet, or sorry, uh, square feet. Um, they'll be on the north side of the building here. Um, it's the target is a kind of the graduate students um, in this area, and so they'll have my, uh, common living space. Um, on each floor, we'll have a full full kitchen, or it's basically two kitchens that are right next to each other with the common living space and gathering space and also co-working um, space in there. And then, uh, so the micro units will have, there's a Murphy bed that's on the inside, and then we have, um, again, with that 200 square feet, it's your wall-to-wall, -wall, um, uh, um, sorry, <laughs> um, uh, cabinets on both sides, and there'll also be a private bathroom for, for each, inside each of those units. Any other questions? Do we want to pull up Nanette's list of questions to see if we? So one of the recommendations I would like to make about your green walls and their sort of push back from the frontage is I think it was somebody who used the word arcade and it got to mind that instead of a flat wall, you might think about a sort of series of sort of whether they're free columns or, or um, Pilasters, you know, so that there's some there's something sort of happening in that depth. Even even a column might be kind of nice, even if there's just a wall right behind it, so that you get you get a different instead of a flat flat flat, you yeah. get actually more sculptural. To we'll try to enhance that depth right. in those park areas. Uh, can we get back to one of the renderings of the facade? Yes. Because this I, one, I, yeah, I would I would make a comment about the opening sizes and the spacing. Um, I do see us forcing people to make changes to that to where the whole facade is glass, and I would really recommend we don't get into that. I think a lot of people talk about human scale, and they don't achieve it because of these like two-story glass walls they put on the ground level. I think this actually does achieve human scale and it's because of the smaller openings. Mm -hmm. um, so I would be an advocate for that. Um, I also appreciate that the smaller lobby, and it's not a whole corner taking up the whole ground level and saying that's public space, because lobbies aren't public space, that's private space. So I do appreciate that being smaller and in the corner and allowing for the coffee shops and the other amenities, which are, are really important, so. All right, thanks John. Yeah, so I'm going to go on record twice. <laughs> in one Whoa, stand case. back. I know. I don't know who I am anymore. But um, I do really like how this looks. And I think you had a couple different challenges. One, you know, you're, you're trying to design for the pedestrian, but you also need to design for this commuting that's going on to have some visual interest. It's like, oh, that's a cool place. Like, I want to go check that out. And I really think you achieved lot of that and so for a lot of your variances I'm going to agree with John on the reduced glass from I think it's 60 percent to 30 you're doing 32 percent um, it feels very inviting and it feels actually from uh, some of your art display rendering ones uh, it does have a lot of that pedestrian um, connection so I uh, as far as your variances goes because of the way you actually designed this and it and I really like it um, I feel very that your your requested variances are really appropriate um, because of how you've treated this. And I don't I I don't know who I am tonight actually anymore because I generally <laughs> always find something I hate about things. We'll give you a pass. <laughs> so. Just just take always it. Always next time, Amy. Yes, and I'll be back in form. I'm sure. Um, yeah, one of my complaints is that a lot of times why I think the intent of these things is we don't get, in my opinion architecture that is looking at how to achieve these. And, and this has done a really good job. And so I personally feel like these variances um, are, are artfully done and playing out well to activate this area. And I'm, I feel really good about it. So. Thank you. Any other comments? Do we want to pull up Nanette's list of questions and make sure we gave planning we, staff? I, my only question is really for planning staff. One thing that is, you, I think, unique about this project, because I, I generally also hate long buildings, um, 
but its site is different where it sits right along front runner and along mm -hmm. and I've trying to spend a lot of time thinking about and we talk about pedestrians and coming and going but is anyone going to be walking along that front facade really going anywhere no. everyone is going from the from they're walking by or they're walking from the inner that kind of the front runner station the bus station kind of into the city and so I don't really know if, if planning staff, and I've spent a lot of time kind of thinking what's what's happening just north of this project, if anyone's actually going to be walking well, where's from. Where's the dog park? Um, you know the dip where the, the, it gets narrow? It's right across, it's right up there. It's right in that corner. It's actually right where they're building the uh, um, pedestrian walkway, too. Right. Should have moved so that closer. So it's north? It is oh. north. So that's who's going to be walking along here. The people walking I mean, their dogs yeah, but I mean, to and you, from the dog park. Right, right there's a dog park where he's yeah, marking yeah. But would you get off the train or a bus and then walk not that direction down not this that way, way and for what purpose? And because then that really matters on what we try to do in terms of making it right. pedestrian friendly and how much we you like know if you're on fourth wet fourth uh, fourth south like along here that we hate these long buildings like that's intended to be somewhere that's and this is got a unique site. Um, yeah, that last piece we're gonna put in, the last piece is that office and plaza. So that's and, all and that, to the south. Yeah, yeah the south. that's what I'm saying. I mean, so it's the all, whole, all by the, the tracks and the bus. This is almost there. scaling from commercial down into residential. Um, it might make more sense in that sense. So. But that's my comment, thank you. All right, any other comments? Any, Nanette, did we give you enough? Okay. Anything else? The only thing I just want to add so everyone's clear that they're not variances that has a very legal meaning. They're just modifications to the standards which are authorized through this process. So just want to make sure that's out there. <laughs> thank you, Nick. <laughs> okay. Thank you all very much. We appreciate thank you. Thank you, for you coming and presenting before you come for a final approval. So that's helpful. Okay. Thank you. Okay. If I offend anybody, it's my passion. I apologize. <laughs> I love what we do. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Changes to planning, commission, policies, and procedures. So th this is just a follow-up to the discussion last week and whether or not the planning commission wants to adopt those modifications. We recognize that there are some challenges and some things that we have to think through before we add something to a consent agenda. I think from my perspective, um, I would like the commission to have that tool if we find it so that we, if we do come up with uh, reasons to have it that we can. Um, adding it to the policies, policies and procedures doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to next meeting have every, you know, all kinds of things on a consent agenda. We don't want to put anything on there that's going to create um, well, that isn't going to achieve the purpose of having it, if that makes sense. So, Nick, in thinking about tonight, there would have been two? Maybe one. Maybe one. Maybe one? Yeah, one. yeah they're, well, they're the, um, the, the reason, <coughs> the recommend, oh, no, because it's a recommendation. So there would have been one? There would have been one. Well, there, so it, I think these are one of the, one of the things that we want to figure out. So, for example, um, let's take those the fire code amendments um, when we have an open house for those no one showed up mm -hmm. so we we sat there for a couple hours um, one method that we could do would be to have the public hearing serve as that public engagement for something like that that is very technical in nature um, within those 45 day period of the early engagement process and then after that after we can assemble the comments, that's something that we could potentially put on a consent agenda after those 45 days pass. So that, that's an example of, of something like that. Um, I don't know how, I mean, one of the things that the Planning Commission is, is charged with under state code is any kind of regulation that impacts the development of property technically is considered a land use code and has to come through the Planning Commission. So. Public Utilities is pretty soon going to be adopting some new federally mandated standards. I'm guessing that none of us here have any clue what those mean. Um, <laughs> and frankly, I don't know that we really care, but... What? Well, 
I, I'm, that's a big assumption on my part, but. Um, <laughs> yeah, so would you use. But when we're talking like pipe size and things like that. Would I don't you know. use one of the standards, of what would go on consent if it was being done because of state or federal laws? It, it could be, if, if the city really has no choice, it could be something like that. And so by putting this in the policies and procedures, we, the, the commission at least has that option. Any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I'm in favor of it. Yeah, so what do we need to do to move forward on that? Uh, you just need to um, make a motion I to move modify that we the accept the recommendations to, is to change the policies and procedures to allow for a consent agenda. And then we will we'll add second those. that. We'll add that language in and we'll go from there. We got a motion by Brenda and a second by Sarah. And I didn't put a chart for this one. Okay, Matt. Consent. <laughs> Sarah. Yes. Carolyn. Agree. Brenda. Yes. Amy. Yes. John. Yes. Okay. There. It's Passes. unanimous. It's unanimous. And with that, there's something to be said for going at the end. Yeah. With that, we are adjourned. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody.